On early Saturday morning, Hamas terrorists crossed the border from the Gaza Strip into Israel. They captured civilians, executed them brutally, and waved around their remains on video for the entire world to see. Now, a war is brewing. In what can only be described as an eerie coincidence, as we all woke up to the news here in America, I had Mark Turner on a previously scheduled flight to come in here for a podcast. Over the past six months, Mark has been training and advising Israeli IDF soldiers on the Gaza border as well as on the West Bank border in Israel. Because of our timing with this sit down, I've decided to debut our new Hoboken studio two episodes early in order to get this one out immediately for you guys. Mark went in depth about what's going on on the ground, the history of the conflict, what's coming next, and much more. So please hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and enjoy the show. Mark, you picked a hell of a day to be here, man. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's wild out there right now. It's it's crazy. I've been distracted all morning and yeah. all night, all yeah. night as well. So for a little bit of a, I guess, like time stamp here on it, this was not going to be the first episode in this studio. We actually had filmed a couple other ones, and there was one where the studio wasn't done. But because of the timing of this, this may end up being the first one in the studio. If not, disregard what I just said. But we are talking right as this potential war is breaking out yeah. between Israel and Palestine, or if you really want to say like Hamas. And you, we're going to get to all the stuff you do today. I'm very excited to talk about this. But you have been over in Israel training people for the past, what, how many months? Yeah, we've been in Israel. Um, it's kind of a new project, new mission on our kind of set of things that we do with the foundation. And we've been over twice. The first time we went, I think was, oh, geez, everything's blending together now on dates. I think the first time we went, it was springtime, so maybe May-ish. Yep. And then after that, I mean, I the reason I didn't come before was because I had to bump you because I went back to Israel, right? It was like July or something we were talking about. I think about so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, July or August. So, yeah, we've been there twice. We were planning on going back actually last week. Um uh, last week, last 10 days, but that was going to get bumped to November. We're in October right now. And um, it looks like I'll be leaving this week or something. Oh, sh We're thinking, we're trying to put something together and everything's, we're talking, we're hours into this whole big war. So everything's very up in the air. I'm having trouble contacting some people and um, nobody really knows what's going on yet, right? So we are early in the morning here um, in New Jersey, and this has been going on since late last night, our time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so everything's up in the air. It's for, nuts. It's for, absolutely crazy. For people out there who are trying to follow this, I mean, there's obviously all kinds of history here that we'll get to some of today, but a lot of it you can't get to. But what what happened? What precipitated this, and, and what specifically is going down? So... Um, there's been a lot of tensions building up. Um, we're, we're learning a lot about what's going on there. Obviously, there's the history, like you said, but we're learning a lot about what's going on currently there with the political climate in Israel, with some of the stuff with Netanyahu and government policy and mm -hmm. all that, and how you know the the terror groups like Hamas, obviously backed by Iran, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad has a huge presence now in Israel that they've been building to take advantage of some of the instability of Israel. Um, since, you know, we have a bunch of contacts in Israel, a bunch of um, non-Israeli contacts in Israel that have really helped fill a lot of that backstory in for us. And, you know, it's been from our sources, which, you know, I won't name every name. I may mention some of these people here or there, but um, some of them your viewers know. Um, mm. You know, this has been building. And um, we just gave a ton of money to Iran, $6 billion last week it was. And what is that for again? That was uh, in part to free a bunch of political prisoners that Iran mm. had. I think it was five guys. So $6 billion for five guys. Um, you know, personally, I don't make U.S. policy, but I don't think we should be giving any money to free our prisoners. I think our prisoners in a state like Iran should be freed or we should go free them. 
Um, Do you think that's realistic, though? I, I think that at one point this country had enough clout and was strong enough to say, hey, free our people or else, and people didn't even want to explore what the what else could be and would comply. Um, I don't think we kind of have that level of oomph right now just for a whole bunch of different reasons, not just with what's going on in the White House, but um, just with the government in general. But we give that $6 billion, and then next thing you know, less than a week later, um, on one of the biggest Jewish holidays uh, on the calendar year, uh, you know, the army kind of has, everyone takes their leave at that point. If you think of it in the West, it's like taking everyone takes their leave and takes their vacation at the end of December kind of thing, right? The holiday period. Yeah. Same kind of thing right now going on in Israel. So, Yom Kippur? Yeah, Yom Kippur happened. This last week has been the last uh, seven, eight days has been Sukkot, right? The Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and it's like a big celebratory time. Um, and if, if, if you've ever seen in Israel or even here, New York, New Jersey, where, uh, or in Chicago, places that have big Jewish community, around this time of year in the fall, they build those kind of little huts or shacks outside mm. their houses, their, their sukkahs, right? Uh, tabernacles. And, and so it's, it's a massive holiday. And this is like the last day. It's a, it's a big day to kind of close it all down. And then that's when they kick this off. Um, with with these attacks um, coming from everywhere, coming from the north, coming in central Israel and the West Bank and all this kind of stuff. And then obviously the stuff that's happening uh, down south on the Gaza border. And, you know, we were talking about it earlier. It's they're hand gliding in. They're coming in by boat. They're Who? Uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad um, in the north coming in from Lebanon. There's been, just from what we've seen this morning, uh, Hezbollah operatives coming in on motorcycles and all this kind of stuff. So they're, they're, it's a mass infiltration kind of from all sides and kind of has caught Israel with their pants down a little bit, right? Mm. Um, and they're just, it's, it's kind of unprecedented for what they're doing. They're going in, they're kidnapping civilians, they're, they're kidnapping and killing military in the streets, and they're taking people from Israel into Gaza, back across the border into Gaza. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I can imagine it's just chaos there right now, trying to figure out what's going on and where it's coming from, you know? So you and I are obviously both very familiar with a lot of the layout over there, because mm -hmm. Israel's something that we both look at and, and study what's going on. But for many listeners right now, who just, you know, they're aware of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they know where this is in the world, they know the basics, but they hear all these names, yep. these different terms, and it's all kind of like jello up there. I want to try to break this down a little bit so that we can follow it. So when you're talking about Hamas, mm -hmm. how much – Hamas is not it's – a, it's a terror organization – that is not supposed to be in charge of Palestine, but they wield a ton of, I guess, like they curry a lot of favor within some of those territories. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So let, <laughs> this is we get we get controversial right off the bat. So, it's all good. That's what we do here. Um, and yay, yeah, you can send me messages if you want. I'm going to say this. <laughs> right. I, I don't really care. This is how I see it. This is how I view it. There is no such place as Palestine. Right. Mm. It's Israel, and um. And that's what it is. Now, the Palestinian people also live in Israel. If you want to talk about Hamas specifically, they are a Palestinian. They're many things, right? <laughs> Hamas wears many hats. They're a political party. They are a military. Um, they're a governing body. They are um, a terrorist organization. And, and they are in control of the entire Gaza Strip in southwest Israel. Alessi, can you pull that map up so that we can have that in the corner of the screen? And the Gaza Strip is a very small piece of land. I think it's maybe, I want to say 20 to 30 miles long. It's very right. small. It's the most densely populated piece of land on our planet, um, you know, per capita for its size. So if you pull up, yeah, there we go. So if you can see that map there, down on the, the bottom left of that map, 
Uh, you see the border. So that's the border of Israel, Gaza, and then Egypt. If you see where the map scale is, that's Egypt, northern Egypt, right? And ISIS controls all of that area right now in Egypt. They control the, where, the, where the Sinai is? Yes. Really? Yes. ISIS is controlling all that. All right, put a bookmark in that. We'll come uh, back to that. Uh, yeah, and our, our, the guys that we are kind of working with and, and, and connected to in Israel, they are active in that area, and, and we've you know had some of those guys from those teams actually get killed and wounded with border operations that are going on in that area. So that's, wow. the, that's the Gaza Strip there. Um, there's big issues between smuggling operations between the border of Gaza and Egypt, right? Some of these groups that, that support Gaza um, get stuff in and out through tunnels from Egypt. And then all along the eastern side of the Gaza border that we see there are these small little kibbutz and farming towns um, that are Israeli. Mm -hmm. And they are heavily, heavily affected by the rockets that um, come from Gaza. Now, in Gaza... It's something, and, and let me see if I can get these numbers correct. I'm working on like 30 minutes of sleep. <laughs> and, <laughs> Sorry to hear that, and, and, and I got that on the flight on the way over here, so thank God for that flight. Um, just with everything that's been going on, I was up all night for, you know, in contact with all our guys. But You've been with it all morning. i got to give it to I'm you. I'm trying man. my best. You're doing good. I'm trying my best. So 60% of the people in Gaza eat because of UN food drops every day. Mm. If there wasn't that amount of food, they, Gaza, they're not feeding their own people. Um, and 90% of the water in Gaza is not drinkable for humans. Yet, we fund the people of Gaza as, as the U.S. government with tens and hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Israel funds um, Gaza and gives Gaza, um, the people, well, the government of Gaza, Hamas, money that's supposed to help build there and, and kind of support all their infrastructure and all this. But Hamas tends to take that money and use it for terror because it's not going to the people. Um, they steal it? Um, I don't know if, they, if stealing it is a good word. To be fair, they're probably just a better way to look at it is that money's being given to that given to that governing body to distribute to its people as aid and it's not being used for that purpose like for instance they had said this was many years ago that they wanted um to rebuild buildings and and housing and all this kind of stuff for people in gaza Israel didn't want to give money for that. They said, look, we don't want to give money. That turns into rockets. What we'll do is we'll give concrete and we will bring concrete into Gaza. There's, there's two entrances into Gaza. It's basically all completely sealed off. There's multiple borders. There's the real international border. There's an Israeli border. And there's two kind of gateways to get in there. There's an international border, you said? Yes, that was put there, um, you know, by... The, the divvy up of the land, but Israel has another border fence closer to them. Um, and I can send you some pictures if you okay. want, if you want yeah, to yeah. show this because I've been there. Yeah, um, if we get some afterwards, we'll, they'll be in the corner. Yeah, of the and, right and now. maybe unless you can find a map there that shows the two fences. But um, if you see what happened was they said we want to rebuild. Okay, well you're not getting money. We'll actually send you the concrete. We'll send you the supplies. We'll send you the stuff that you need to build. And that turned into the very famous concrete terror tunnels that were mm. built, you know, from Gaza into Israel um, and have been used for terror. They would pop out. I've actually stood at the mouth of one of these tunnels that there's a very famous video online where these Hamas operatives come out of the tunnel. They go to the IDF outpost, kill five to ten um, IDF soldiers that are in that outpost. Um, Israel says five, Hamas says 10, the videos there, you can watch guys getting killed and then they go right back down into the tunnel. Mm. So stuff like that, it's, you know, it's a terrible place. The people there are very poor. They have a really, really, really high, um, illegal drug problem there with young people, right? You know, I really feel for those people. We're working on some projects in Israel to help them. Obviously I'm very biased towards Israel. If you ask me to pick a side, it's Israel for, for a number of reasons, um, but we love the Palestinian people as well. There's a lot of peaceful Palestinian people 
that need help and need support. And, you know, one of the things we've noticed in our first mission to Israel was an Israeli man, an Israeli, basically a mayor of one of these little border towns that is going to get, he goes and he gets special permission from the Israeli government to screen, properly screen and hire Palestinians from inside Gaza and he puts them to work in his field. Now, mm. here's why. And, and they just cross over to do it. So here's what happened. Mm. His little border town was getting absolutely, you know, every time something kicks off, his border town gets it, or border town gets it, right? Rockets, some of the stories will break your heart here. And, you know, they would send over balloons with incendiary devices. So imagine like a, you know, imagine a, a cluster of like 30 kids balloons mm. and in the middle is an incendiary device and they float this thing over and all the kids in the, in the village, oh, look, 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 the balloons. And when it lands, yeah. and I've seen the incendiary devices, I have a picture, you know, I mean, I can show you these things. And they, they also would burn the crops, right? They're sending these incendiary devices over to burn the crops. And so what he said was, he said, look, I'm going to go get permission to hire some of these people to work in my fields. Now, what he pays them is probably less than if he got an Israeli to work there. It is a kibbutz, so it's kind of like a little communist. Uh, yeah, can you explain that to people who aren't familiar? Yeah, so the kibbutz system in Israel, it's it's kind of a very interesting thing. It's If you think of, it's kind of communism. People live in these little communities and they work in the community and everyone works for each other. Um, and sometimes it's with grapes, sometimes it's with various crops, right? Um, right on the border, they have a ton of different crops there and they would send that stuff over and, and get, it would be all be sent on fire. So he hires them at less as less money than what he could pay an Israeli. He doesn't pay anyone to work on his farm, obviously. So that's kind of irrelevant, but he pays them in one day, what it would take them 30 days to make in mm. Gaza doing anything else. So he's changing the lives of these of these Palestinian people. And I said to him, I said, this is fantastic. Um, and we met him by chance. And it was, you know, we were there with the unit that we were there with. And he kind of came down in a truck. And the guys were like, oh, you want to talk to this guy? And I was like, okay. So he starts telling us a little bit of history. And he starts going into this story that I've been telling you. And uh, I was like, well, this sounds good. But do they live here with you in the community, these people from Gaza? Or do they go back home? And he goes, no, no, they go back home. He goes... If they're working in my field, they can see their neighborhood, some of them. Like they can see, mm. but he goes, we're neighbors. I mean, from that, from that so little, that little town, it's 650, 700 meters to Gaza. Right there. They're that close, right? Um, you're talking, we were, we were looking at your neighborhood around here from, from your window. I mean, we were looking at places that are just as close. Um, it's unbelievable. And I said, well, here's the deal. If you're sending them back with that much money and they have to, they have permission to be in Israel and they've been screened, however they do that process. Um, I said, but if you're sending them back, doesn't Hamas just take that money? Like it's a lot of money for it. He said, well, we know they take a tax from these people because <laughs> we don't always just pay them in cash. He goes, we know they need food, right? They need food. So we'll take them shopping on the Israeli side and he goes, it's kind of funny sometimes to see them walking with all the bags, all they can carry and groceries and all this kind of stuff or clothes for their kids and all this kind of stuff, whatever it is they need. But he said, yeah, Hamas takes some of the money. I said, well, aren't you funding, you're basically funding your own terrorism because obviously if it's Hamas, that's kind of what they do. That's their business. They, you know, they're sending those, right. he said, I don't really look at it like that. He goes, these people are our neighbors. We don't hate them. This is an Israeli man telling me this, right? We don't hate them. We live next to each other. And we want to show them that there's a better life for them other than living under the rule of Hamas in, in Gaza. Guess what, everybody? It is that time of year again. Football season is officially upon us, and you know what that means. It is time to place those bets. As a better, you demand perfection, and my bookie delivers. NFL, college football, and a brand new cash out system gives you the opportunity to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit. With my bookie, you can cash out and place a new bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger prize. So join the my bookie family for an entire season filled with daily odds boosts, same game parlays, and super contests. Oh yeah. 
there's also a special twist. Down in the description below, there's a link that will take you directly to my bookie's homepage. Once you're there, hit the big join now button in the top right corner and then use promo code Dory, D-O-R-E-Y, on a deposit of $50 or more to get up to $200 injected instantly right into your account. Once again, click that link below and use the promo code Dory, D-O-R-E-Y, on your first $50 deposit or more and get cash quick. And that blew me away. And I said, okay, on the humanitarian side, that's something we can get behind. And, and that's kind of one of our objectives there is, is trying to raise money so that he, we're going to use his little village and his idea um, to hire more of these people and then take the concept to other border towns in the Gaza area to try and, and broker some peace between the people. You're not getting peace with Hamas. It's not going to happen. Yeah, so what is that? What does that matter then? If, if you can't broker peace with Hamas, why? Yeah, I mean, I think the way they look at it is, I mean, it's kind of like anything else. If you have that, it's that bully mentality, right? You have this group that is very powerful, very commanding, you know, and, and the people vote them in, quote unquote, vote them in right as as their government yeah i don't know that i believe that yeah, I, I don't either i'm not there obviously right but um yeah i mean i don't believe it either that's the government they have and the they're obviously not working for the people the government's not working for the people and so i guess the hope is and you'd have to this is me speaking for them the hope is that if they can see that there's something better than hamas and they can see that there's people outside that support them, maybe they rise up and ask for change or try and make change. I mean, you could say that sounds very far-fetched, but it happened in Egypt, it happened all over. Yeah, 79. That, that happened all over the Arab world, right? So um, I but guess- But those aren't right. The thing about those is they aren't right there and it's not over the land. The other deals we're talking about, right? right. Now, Egypt, there's some of that. There was, there yeah, was some and question I mean, with and land. I mean, and look, but- with the land, Israel gave gaza to the palestinian people there there were is right now here here's the deal you people have to remember this there are millions of arabs that live in israel right mm-hmm. millions there are arabs in the idf there's israeli defense forces yep in, in the military there are arab police israeli police officers there's arab um political parties and members of parliament in yeah. the knesset Arabs function in Israeli society all over the place. They can own businesses. They can do this. They can do that. There are no Jews in Gaza. And if an Israeli went into Gaza, he would last maybe eight and a half seconds probably, <laughs> right? Maybe less, right? Maybe a couple seconds more. <laughs> it's you're not allowed. And even when you're in the West Bank, there's many areas where you're driving and and the West Bank's very broken up into kind of little towns and communities separated by a bunch of mountains and nothing and then another community. And there's signs saying, if you're Israeli, do not come in here. You don't Mm. see that on the Israel side. It's just not there. You don't see any of that on the Israel side? There's no signs running around where it says, Arabs cannot come here. What about all the settlements? I mean, those are, some of that doesn't look good. When you when you see to to give a little context there for people, there's parts of the West Bank. So you have we've been talking about Gaza, which is on the west side of mm-hmm. of Israel, with our direction looking here, and then we have the West Bank, which is actually on it's the kind of like the east and central. Yes. Yep. So those are those are like the Palestinian territories. And by the way, we'll come we'll come back to your <laughs> comment about about Palestine. There not being a thing. I, I didn't want people thinking we forgot that. I just want to. I don't want to jump around too much. But there are settlements that happen where Israelis, with the backing of the government, come in and settle kibbutzes and communities within the areas that are supposed to be Palestinian territory. And I always recognize that in, especially in this conflict, everything you see from both sides, there is going to be some level of propaganda to it. Sure. So you have to be very careful with videos you see. And I have seen videos get disproven by a video with more context five seconds later after I saw it. And that's that's just how it is sometimes. Right. But 
you have seen a lot of situations and these videos are floating online where people, Palestinians on their land that was given to them, they're forced to be kicked out of it by new Israeli settlers who are coming in. So when you see stuff like that, that's where I would push back and say, well, is there really no Israelis going on to some of these? Yeah, so there's been there's been some of that, and a lot of that stuff has been kind of, I don't know if reprimanded is the correct word. Um, because, look, I've been to the West Bank. There's plenty of places to live there. There's new communities, Arab and um and is really popping up all over the place. I mean, you want to say cats and dogs living together. It, it, there's a lot of mixed communities. There's communities where they butt up right next to each other and everything's fine, right? Some of those videos that you do see where it's um, Arabs being kicked out, Israel has this policy where, okay, let's say you are Johnny Shithead, Palestinian terrorist, and you committed some terrorist act they still have that concept of not only are you going to be punished for it. Oh, your whole family. Your whole family. And and a lot of the Middle East is like that. It's not just an Israeli thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a Palestinian thing as well, right? They do it to their own and it's just a, it's their culture. And so part of what they do also is they destroy the house. So sometimes you see a video of a house being destroyed and you're like, those are Israelis destroying that Palestinian house. And like you said, there's no context. And you're like, yeah, that guy, that guy runs a bomb-making operation in the West Bank or something, right? It's like, yeah, that's what they do. They knock the house down. And then that's pitched as a whole community is getting knocked down or this, that, or the next thing. So, yeah, you really do have to be careful what you're watching. And neither side is perfect in this. Right. But, you know, my, my adult life and my kind of career has been built around trying to be against terrorism and combating terrorism. And, you know, what Hamas does cannot be looked at as anything other than terrorism. What about, what's the makeup there? And I don't know if we can pull that up, Alessi, if we can search what percentage of Hamas is comprised of native Palestinians. Like how how much of it is that versus, you know, quote unquote, yeah, freedom know. fighters being sent in with money from other countries. Yeah, I think there is some of that, you know, obviously um, where there's a fight to be had. We saw that in Iraq as well, right? I mean, a lot of the guys that we were engaging with were not Iraqi. They were Syrian. They were right. Jordanian. Um, we saw a lot of that. And, and then I'm, in Syria too. That right, was crazy. Right. Yeah, was same, same yeah. thing. You had people, it's, it's proxy type stuff. And there is a lot of that happening, um, you know, I think they kind of stopped sending in straight like Iranian Hezbollah type people because then it's pretty obvious. If you're Gaza is trying to say that Israel is terrorizing you and killing civilians and all this, you can't be running around with people right off the Iranian boat right. kicking around in your city, right? right. Um, so I think they've kind of quelled some of that stuff. Um, ethnically, if you if you do trace the Palestinian people of Gaza back, they have a Egyptian origin, which that means a lot of different things, right? Egypt kind of is a, is a, has many branches of people right. that, that it's like the have, center of the world have originated from yeah. there. But yeah. So if you trace them back, those people were not actually in the land of Israel. If you go back far enough, they came from um, Egypt. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure there are some people there stirring the pot and look, at the same time, too, if if you're a government body that's legit on the world stage, if you are a government that's for your people, if you're a fair and just military, why are you building your command posts in children's elementary schools? Why are you putting your command posts in the basements of children's hospitals? You're talking about Hamas here. Yes. Yeah, but the, so Hamas, I, I wouldn't even, I don't even think that's an argument at this point. Like, there, that is clearly... Dirty money and there's a lot of and, people that would argue that they're freedom fighters, right? But well, that's how they're supposed to. The people who are arguing that are part of the ones kind of funding this problem, right? Yeah. But when you look at like the actual people who live there, right? The people who are born there, the people who are not, and then don't become a part of Hamas, right? Like a lot of people there, a lot of the Palestinians, they're not no. crazy about Hamas no. at all. No, you're right. Yeah. And that, again, that's like in that, in that border town, that's kind of what's being, those are the people that are, you know, and there's a lot of people, look, there's a lot of people in Gaza. You want to talk about poverty. It's, 
It's poverty to the highest degree. Like I said, it's the most densely populated piece of land on this planet, right? Yeah. And and here's the thing. Gaza, uh, and, and a little bit different than the West Bank. Gaza technically, and, and this this will raise eyebrows as well, the verbiage I'm going to use, <laughs> but Gaza technically is free. Hamas runs Gaza. So do what you want there, right? Govern it how you want. Appropriate your resources how you see fit. Doesn't really seem like they're doing too good of a job. There's yeah, because no- what's the status of Israeli forces? Are there any in the Gaza Strip right now? Um, and look, I'm not saying this for fact. I'm not saying that I know this or I know okay. anyone in we can there. Check the there, there are there are no like Israeli forces, um, overt Israeli forces in Gaza. Okay. There may be some intelligence yes. service stuff. There may be, but. Again, they don't do a lot of that because of how dangerous it is for you to be out there with basically your, you know, your dick in your hand running around Gaza right. as an Israeli. Um, but no, there's no outpost. There's no Israeli outpost there. They have it right on the border on the Israeli side of the fence. There's outposts, um, but there's no Israeli outposts. Kind of like uh, opposed to the West Bank, where there's is Israeli outposts. Basically, wherever there's a a Jewish community or an Israeli community in the West Bank, there is a outpost protecting that community mm. out of necessity. Has this been the policy since Ariel Sharon put that through, I guess, like 15, with the, 20 years ago? With the military units guarding the communities, you mean? With giving them, giving them autonomy. Over that region, yeah, it was it was it was part of that whole land for peace stuff, and it was mm-hmm. like, hey, because because there was Israelis living in the Gaza Strip, there were mm-hmm. Israelis, yeah, yeah, then they leave. and and they pulled every they pulled everyone out, yeah. right? And so, you know, again, pulled them out. Those people were uprooted. Israel obviously took care of those people, gave them places to live, all that kind of stuff. But there are no Israelis in the Gaza Strip. Again, if you want to say that's a lie, well, yeah, there's there's the secret kind of intelligence operations that probably yeah go they on definitely there. happen yeah, for sure. We're right. talking about. I mean, Israel has the best intelligence services in the yeah, world. Like, right. of course that happens, but that's happening everywhere. Right. Like, this is what all but, power but that, players that's it. do. There's no yeah. outposts. There's no you know. I mean, there's no um, Israeli businesses in there. There's no places where Israelis live in there. Um, but the West Bank is different. The West Bank's different. It's cats and dogs living together. Okay. And there's new there's new communities. I mean, I, I was just there. There's new communities popping up, like I said, on both sides. Um, and, you know, they live relatively peacefully. Uh, there will be, incur- you, again, you don't really see a lot of Israeli citizens going into Arab villages and stabbing someone or shooting someone. You see it a lot coming from the other side. And it's not Arab, the, the peaceful Palestinian Arab people doing this. It's these Islamic Jihad. It's, right. you know, various factions of different groups that operate in the West Bank that are doing this. It's the bastardization of what they actually want. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's that old saying that, you know, for, for Israel, you have to put yourself in that position where... When this is going on in your own neighborhood, I mean, think of 9-11 that happened here. You know, you can't just let that happen. Right. And it happened once here. It happens a lot there, right? And it's happening all the time. It's happening, uh, you know, across various different capacities of how it's occurring. You can't just allow that to happen. The old adage of, you know, if... if um, the the pal if if Hamas gave up their militant side there'd be peace and if if Israel gave up their uh, military and their weapons there'd be no Israel right I mean that kind of rings true when when Hamas's charter is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and kill every Jew I, we can't really negotiate if that's your if that's your operating charter we can't sit at a table and talk yeah but I I don't think there's ever been I've never seen a really good argument for any negotiation with Hamas in particular, which then makes it hard when you're talking with like the PLO and everything. They do negotiate with them, <laughs> which is, again, it's not real go- negotiations at that point, right? On on more things that don't amount to peace though. Right. You know what I mean? So any peace 
agreements in air quotes there that we've seen say over the past with, with respect vis-a-vis like Israel and Palestine over the past 30 years or so they seem to kind of be maybe slightly with the exception of Sharon's in in the mid 2000s they seem to be something where it's more just symbolic rather than actually accomplishing anything I think a lot of it too has been a lot of pressure from the west just sit down we're gonna sit at this table we're locking the door and we're not leaving till we figure something out right and so then whatever gets figured out is kind of not it's made of chocolate at that point you know what i mean it's just we got that done we got something out of it they got something out of it we'll let the kind of this roll over and we can kick stuff up in another eight to ten years or something and that kind of seems to be how it is and look my opinions are my opinions i don't i'm not trying to convince anybody in anything i'm not saying it should be this way or it should be that way I think it's just, this is the way it is. And maybe I see it this way and maybe someone else can see it another way. That's completely fine. I actually think on the Israeli side, I think they're just kind of, and it's it's weird to say this, but I think they're just kind of used to it. Like they're accepting of it. Like this is what's going to happen. Hmm. These people are going to, they are going to be here. They're constantly going to be trying to get rid of us and wipe our entire existence off the map. And we just have to deal with it. And we're going to do the best we can with it because I think everything that's been tried on both sides hasn't really worked. You know, fair to say, very fair to say, but to, to go back to the point you made towards the beginning of this conversation about your stance on there being no such thing as Palestine. Why, why do you say that? Um, just, I mean, it goes way back. Obviously people want to talk about the, the British mandate. That's fairly recent. Very <laughs> in, recent. Yeah. In, in world history, right? Um, you know, you want to go, you, you can go all the way back to the time of the, the second temple period where, you know, there were Jewish people in the land and everything kind of got fractured and split up due to Rome and all that kind of stuff to say, I mean... What look, years is that, approximately? Uh, you're talking, well, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. So, yeah, I mean, that's way, way back, right? And you want to argue, well, okay, if you go back to the time before Moses, there were no um, Jews in the land. I mean, you, you could we, we could nickel and dime that all the way, but there's a huge Palestinian, and not just Palestinian, Middle Eastern outlook that there were never any Jews in that land. Which yeah, is, see, that's wrong. Which is just sure. completely wrong. Yes, it's like wrong right? on every level. On an archaeological level, on a history, a history level, I mean, we have different ancient Near Eastern people groups from that region, whether they be Canaanite or whatever, that have records of all different, you know, tribes or, or different types of... yes. Israeli people in that land. So it's just, that that's just not a fact that can be um, disputed. And it's when people start at, well, yeah, the British mandate Palestine. Okay, they just literally made that stuff up when they when they had it, right? I mean, and, and that's very recent in history. You're saying that- Yeah, that mandate started World War One, right? Yeah, and, and so you're saying that's where you want, that's your starting point. Like that's where you want to start history okay, it's going to be tough to have a conversation if you're starting history of that land at that point. Right. This is where it gets a little weird for me, though, because I try to, you know, time is so long, and and our spans that we think is long is actually very short, obviously. But the the history there, like, my belief, first of all, is that, like, Israel's country has a complete right to exist. They're an amazing ally of America. Like, there's a lot of things I love about Israel. I understand some of the plight coming from not necessarily Hamas people, right. obviously, but from actual Palestinians who may also be worked up about the situation and who, you know, there are surviving people right now who were there when the British mandate ended sure. in, officially in, in 1948. And there was obviously the whole clash of different Arab countries coming in and, and fighting with Israel. But when you look at the history here, if the Israelis, the, the Jewish people were mostly kicked out of the land, I'm going to mess up the exact years here, but we're going to ballpark it. Somewhere, you know, like 700 AD, something like that, they were kind of removed from their land. I mean, it was, right. it was theirs, right? Yeah. 1,300, 1,200 years later, they come back, and the Palestinian people, again, as you pointed out, this is like kind of a 
I, I forget that it had it, there was like a Roman meaning to that name or something, but the British man died of Palestine. Right. It was like a Western invention, right? Right. The Palestinian people, though, the let's call them the Arabs who lived there, they had lived on this land for like whatever it was, twelve hundred right. years, something like that. Mm-hmm. Not to say you can't find a way to split it up and have two countries there because other people, uh, very historical people, have have a have a name to this land. In this case, the Jewish people. But I I at least understand what that would feel like to be taken from what you have. And I would. This is not a perfect parallel at all, but on somewhat of a parallel, you know, there are things that happened in let's even just focus on North America and where we sit right now five, four or 500 years ago where there were Native Americans living here. Right. And I don't know about my ancestors. I don't think I have anyone who was here, but the ancestors of this country did kick them out. So now imagine if even 400 years later, right. the Native Americans, and obviously like I feel horrible for what happened there, but imagine if they suddenly came back and said, get the fuck out to all of us. There, there's a tiny little bit. Well, I mean, there's obviously a few differences. Definitely. Well, a few one differences. thing though, there always was Jewish people in that land, even during the British mandate yes. and all that kind of stuff. There was remnants yes. of people that stayed and they functioned with, with under whatever rule was in that land. And, you know, you can kind of look at it and say, well, governments and sometimes borders, right? Look at Africa, change all the time. Governments, political setups, all this kind of stuff change all the time. No one in Israel that I've ever heard of is saying that Arabs can't live in that land. No one's ever saying that. I could probably find a few, but but nobody, by and large. No, nobody that's any kind of decision right. maker. I mean, right. you have radicals on every side yes. of every. Thing we have them happen, here right? in America. Yeah, we're, yep. we're, I mean, we're we're not going to sit around and talk about the the really crazy exceptions to to of, of opinions that are out there about anything, right? I mean, there'd be people saying they don't like that you're wearing a hat right now, and you should yeah, never yeah. wear a hat, and, right. and you're like, what are you talking about? You, <laughs> you know, so. There's no one in Israel who's ever clamoring for on any kind of viable way that Arabs should not live in that land. On the other side, there's a, there's huge governing bodies, huge influential people, um, leaders of other countries in the region that are saying no Jews should live in that land. And so if one side is saying, hey, we can all just kind of get along. We can figure this out. And, and they're in the government. Like I said, the Arabs have their political parties. You know, they, in the last kind of election, when Netanyahu came back, the Arab parties had a huge swing in, in how that went. Cause they have to, the way they do their government's different there, right? We don't have to really get into it, but you vote for different parties to lead and then you have to form coalition government Mm -hmm. it's very different than what we do very different and you need to the the, whoever is in charge or going to be in charge or trying to be in charge has to make these deals with these other parties it kind of it's like the senate in star wars you have all these different political parties it's not a two-party system and um it's not even like a three or four party system it's it's a lot they have a lot going on. And so you have to make this a little cool. And, and the Arab um, parties were very influential in that. They have a big role in government, you know, and, and they can, like I said, they can run businesses. They are police officers. They're in the military. They have, they have their own um, kind of groups and, and divisions and all this in the military. And they're mixed with the Israelis as well. Um, no one's saying they can't function there. No one's saying they, can, they can't live there. And on the other side, if, if you let them have their way, it's nope. Everybody not only has to be out, everybody needs to die. Right. That's kind of crazy. You know, I mean, <laughs> we not, we've never done anything like that in this country, right? Where people have to die. I mean, we've done, so, there's been some bad stuff in this country happen, obviously. You mentioned with the, the Native Americans and stuff, but it wasn't like we have to kill every single one of them. It was basically if anybody stands up against, they're going to get that right. Sure. Um, still, atrocities happened, but when, again, if if you want to make peace or you want to have some kind of arrangement where both groups can function, it can't be that we we can't be talking apples and oranges like that. Where it's like, hey, yeah, we can all live together and figure it out. We're kind of doing that now. Why don't you guys just get on board? And then the other side's like, no, you guys all have to get out and die. We're never going to get anywhere. 
Yeah, I, I think the other thing here, you mentioned it a little bit ago quickly, but you talk about like the Western influence with some of these talks and, and the way this stuff goes. You also got to remember that that, the internal politics of Israel and the stances of politicians there, they also come into the come into context with these Western leaders. And what I mean in English, what I mean by that is, for example, you have Netanyahu, who we'll talk about, who's basically been in charge for mostly a, a long time now in Israel. He is a very conservative right-wing guy. He didn't get along with Barack Obama in the United States, who's a more liberal left-wing guy. And so that affects – like it's not yes. just simple foreign policy of like, okay, here's the issue. There's also like political right. differences that then affect – complete approach in the area because we always think of political differences as our bullshit like domestic fights and stuff right. yeah it's like, but like what, internationally it's the same thing it's like what lens are you looking at it through as, as an american president when you look to say that conflict in right. israel totally different culture totally different thing what lens are you looking at it through are you looking at it through what's actually going on are you looking at it through your political differences with whoever's in charge then it's it's very dynamic and very very complex on how policy can change from one side to the other, right? I mean, obviously you saw the big swing with um, the the difference in politics looking at Israel between President Obama and President Trump. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't get Light much. Switch, you yeah. cannot get much different than that. And, and it's, you know, Again, you also have to look at it through the, the the lens of this is an ally. How are we going to treat this ally as an ally? Yes, that's a whole other little kind of like sliver that you have to pie off and 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 look at as well. And it's just yeah, it's it's a very complex situation. You know, it's 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 probably the one of the more challenging situations, whether you're there and part of it. Or you're outside looking in, like say as an American politician or, or president or even a citizen or something that the world's ever seen. I mean, it's so, so there's so many different ways to look at that and, and to try and cut it up and try and parse it. It's just, it's almost impossible, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, the thing I really empathize with about the Israelis big time is how quickly the world kind of moves on with stuff and forgets about some of the things that they deal with. You know, you had the Holocaust, which was the last camps were freed in 1945, so less than 80 years ago, which yep. is a wild thing for me to think about. That is mm -hmm. not that long ago. Yep. And, you know, this was a situation where an entire race was attempted to be exterminated off the face of planet Earth. And yeah. yet... 25 years later, 27 years later, the world gives Munich, Germany, the Olympics. Okay, you want to prove that Germany's rebuilt themselves, denazify. Okay, all right, I can get with that. But, you know, for people who haven't heard the very famous story, like that was the Olympics where you had, in this case, Palestinian terrorists break into the Olympic village, take hostage nine of the 11 Israeli athletes, two of them they killed right away. There was a standoff for a few days. And in this time, because at this point, you know, we're post-1967 Six-Day War right. in Israel. Israel has been around for 25 years. They're respected as one of the better armies in the world. Their intelligence is already top tier, if not the best. And so they offer their help to Germany. Germany tells them to fuck off. Mm -hmm. The Olympics go on. Right. The Olympics right. didn't stop. Yes, Literally all these countries around the world 27 years later, we're like, all right, let's hope that figures itself out. We're going to keep playing our little games here. That's crazy, yeah. And then, for again, for people who know the story, all those athletes ended up being murdered. They were all gone. And, you know, to me, that's, that's when Israel really snapped and realized, like, wow, you know, we're, we're always going to have to have some sort of advantage diplomatically to be able to to be able to survive. And so when when you hear the the 
I don't know if the term is like rhetoric I want to use here, but we're going to get away with it for a second. When you hear the rhetoric of Israelis constantly talking about like they will blow us off the face of the earth, talking about Hamas, talking about Iran, which definitely that one, I, I, I oh, can see yeah. that. Yeah. They're not kidding, and I get the desperation. Yeah, I mean, how many times does somebody have to tell you that they're going to punch you in the face before you kind of start – Right. changing angles and maybe keeping your hands off you know what i mean right. it's like you, you have to kind of believe somebody at, at that point and yeah i mean it's just it's it's just so but but the problem is here look if you and i were having an argument i believe what i believe you believe what you believe and we could be very animated about that we could be coming to blows and all that but if alessi steps in he can kind of cool her head you know cool down the heads he can look He's kind of wrong here. You're kind of wrong there. You're right there. We can go back and forth, and and it, we probably will just call each other names and be done with it. You can't get to that kind of conclusion. We still don't like each other, but you, you can't get to that kind of conclusion in this conflict because one side literally doesn't want the other side to exist. So I guess I just don't know. And, and if that is your stance is against Israel, what's your solution? I hear, I've heard a lot of people against Israel. I've heard a lot of people saying, using kind of one-off things here or one-off things there or a situation that was really bad that is not occurring anymore but did happen as proof for, hey, this is they're the bad guys, let's just say, right, for mm -hmm. lack of better terms. Okay, so what's your solution? There's no solution coming from that side. Nobody wants to say... Well, some people say Israel shouldn't exist in that case, right? And, which but, is I mean, not a solution. Th that that would be the Hamas kind of right. side, which right. your average. I mean, look, we can say it this way. I've seen all the groups. I've seen the homosexuals for Palestine and the transsexuals for Palestine. I've seen it. It's like you want to go to Gaza and tell them who you are and that you support them. You'll be hanging off a crane by right, then, right? Yeah, that stuff. That it's the and, stupidity. Of and that so again, again, you're that kind of activist. We can't have a conversation. Like yeah. I can't talk to you about this because if you're that off, that you don't, then you don't understand what's going on. How can we have a conversation? Yeah, well, I can try and we we can try and show you some stuff. We can give you the Google machine and maybe you can try and look some of this stuff up on your own and then come back and maybe we can have a talk. But you're not going to stand up there on your multicolored rainbowed soapbox <laughs> and talk to me about this happening in this part of the world or that part of the world when you wouldn't last 10 minutes there because of what they would do to you, regardless of if you support them or not. So, and, and that kind of stuff just becomes noise, right? And, and they're up there just running, you know, their sewers. Someone like me completely dismisses that and nothing, nothing's going to get done. Right. So it, there's just that's where that's where kind of that, that difficulty comes in. And I think that's where I don't know this to be fact. It's just an opinion to me from what I've seen. And, and I talk to a lot of people there. They just kind of are used to it. It's just this is life. You know, this is life. This is what we deal with. This is how we live. The kids go to school. Work continues. We watch our sports. We do this. We do that. And and this is just part of our life, which to us, I mean, you know, imagine we, we're very close to New York, New Jersey, the, the border there, right? We're very close. Like it's hop on right a, there. Hop on a, literally hop on the other on a side. bridge and you're there, right? Yep. Imagine, and we'll equate what's happening right now as we're sitting here talking. Imagine somebody hops on that bridge from New York, drives over and takes citizens, your neighbors, out of their houses and in the streets, they're either throwing them in cars and taking them back to New York or they're killing them right there in the streets. They're coming in and they're taking the mayor of these New Jersey towns and killing them or capturing them. I mean, it's madness. It right? is madness. We, we can't get our heads around that. And, and you, kinda, you can dismiss an example like that because you're like, well, come on, that's never going to happen. Like it's New York, New Jersey. I mean, it might happen in New York, New Jersey. I've heard some things, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Please don't, don't at me, New York and uh, New Jersey. I knew you were kidding. I that's love, why I, I didn't get all over I love you. you all, right? But there, there have been, um, that, that is a direct kind of thing that goes on and we just can't get our heads around that. And that happened this morning in that country. 
And if you don't believe, we can pull up videos, we can show you all this. It's the fact, you know, we have social media, we have these things right now. You can watch it live happening, you know? Yeah, Alessi, pull up some videos on there. We are definitely not going to be able to put a lot of these in the corner of the screen, and we're probably going to mosaic some of it on the screen on the third camera here just because, you know, the episode will get demonetized. But, you know, what we're looking at, there's, there's one video of... In this case, if you go down right there, the woman, the dead woman right there, Alessi. So there's a video right here. I guess that's a picture. It's a screenshot, but I did see the video earlier of an Israeli woman who her body was lifeless and limp in the back of a pickup truck. I guess she had been captured by the border or something like that. I'm not entirely sure. And they were parading her around. And again, like when we're watching all these, and I'm, I've been seeing videos from from the different angles this morning you know like, i'm always careful with context this one right here this is what was this one you were telling me was, about this one I they think. were uh they kidnapped those women and they're taking them and and those people there and taking them to uh to gaza are these kibbutz workers uh they're probably on the border towns of gaza yeah i mean so I, they crossed the border and got these people yes yeah and they're knocking the fence down i mean there's videos all over the internet right now of them using all kinds of heavy machinery and stuff to and and you know it actually happened a couple of weeks ago they were um probing the fence lines and stuff right there's that video that famous video that showed the um the hamas operatives ch trying to mess with the fence and they blew themselves up that happened a couple of weeks yeah. ago three four weeks ago so they've been they, this is and, and look that's something we haven't talked about yet there's always little incursions from Gaza into southern Israel. There's always, I mean, we just saw a couple of months ago with the stuff in Janine in the West Bank and, and some of these little infiltrations that happen. This is a massive, massive, massive thing that's going on. This is huge amounts of people coming in from Gaza and kidnapping people and killing them in the streets. I mean, they're in the streets in Tel Aviv. Where, where's, where's the IDF? That's what I'm wondering. So, so I always again, see that we're going to talk about some of the stuff you've been right yeah. on the border with, but I always see footage and imagery, and this, this doesn't mean it's the definition of it. Obviously, it's not. But the imagery on the borders is that the IDF always has people stationed, like in the videos I've seen, but they obviously do. they weren't here Yeah, they've been getting spot. they've been getting overrun. So on the border, there are... Of, of Gaza, there are various outposts, and I'm not going to talk about exactly what kind of outposts. I don't know of all of them. I've been to a few of them. I know the capabilities that right, they so have you there. Don't wanna... Not going to get right, into that. Right. Um, you know, some of those are bigger than others. Some are more equipped than others. And there's been reports that some of these outposts are being overrun. And, and you know, they went in very early and, you know, yes, these guys should have watch. I don't know their entire setup. They should have a watch. But again, if two of us are sleeping, there's three people in this room, two of us are sleeping and one's up on watch and we're completely racked out laying in our skivvies dreaming about, right. you know, whatever. It's kind of hard to get. I mean, there's also videos of, of literally that guys with their kit on and their rifle in their underwear you know, shooting back kind of thing. So this was, uh, you know, caught with your pants down, Pearl Harbor type thing. Again, at the end of this holiday, there was huge reports that um, during Yom Kippur, you mentioned it earlier, during Yom Kippur, there was a bunch of reports. And, and I again, I, I'm not going to talk too into how we were involved in this, but there was a lot of reports coming out that various biblical archaeological sites in various places in Israel were under threat during mm. this holiday period. Um, I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm trying to be careful what I say. And so some attention was put to that um, for obvious reasons, right? The military is already on that kind of more relaxed posture for the holiday time as it is you know, every year and as it is here during our holiday times. Yeah, you know, you could argue if that's good policy or not. I've talked to a bunch of our guys about this, um, our operators and former operators, and it's like, you know what would happen with us? You'd just be told your leave's been canked and, you know, you we need you at work kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? You need to go to work. You need to be protected. So 
I don't know if those reports, they were legit reports. I've seen them. I was kind of involved in some of that stuff. We were. Um, I don't know if those reports were just kind of misinformation or distraction, mm. but this is something that's been planned. Maybe if, if all that's, nothing happened during that time, by the way, nothing really happened during the, the um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur type time. So you think, okay, there was reports. We're good. Seems like everything's okay. Yeah. And then right at the end, of the, the last day of Sukkot, that's like the final thing, final big event, big holiday, this kicks off in a massive way. It comes from the north. It comes from the south. It comes from the sea, the air. They're infiltrating by land. You know, it's Hezbollah. It's Islamic, Islamic Jihad. It's Hamas. It's kind of all these groups something's, this has been planned and coordinated. Wait, so Hezbollah is involved with this? Yeah, right I mean, now. we, yeah, there's, um, if you, there's, there's videos, I don't know if you can find it. I, I have it. I can, I can, on a, on a break, maybe I, I send it to you or point it out. Um, Hezbollah, uh, operatives on motorcycles, like off-road motorcycles coming in from Lebanon. Can you explain to people who aren't familiar with Hezbollah just specifically who they are? Yeah, Hezbollah, Hezbollah is a um, terrorist organization that's heavily backed by um, Iran. They're basically kind of like a proxy army for right. Iran. Um, kind of, it's it's... It's kind of like <laughs> that was why we murked that guy a few years ago, right? So Soleimani. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, he was yeah. like he had shit. To yeah, do with and them. They, they've been in, involved. Obviously, people may be familiar with like the the Lebanon conflicts with Beirut and all that kind of stuff as well. They were heavily involved in, in all. What's of that. going on there? Well, I mean, it's still going on there back from like the seventies and eighties and all that kind of stuff. But Hezbollah, obviously, Iran's been building the last. I don't know. Since, since President Obama was basically giving them all our lunch money, right? Um, the pallets of cash type thing. Iran's been building itself up on its world stage for quite a while now, right? And Obama, that you're, to, you're referring to the nuclear deal, obviously, yes, right? Yes, right. So Obama wanted to make a deal where we would remove some economic sanctions from Iran, give them some money in that way. And then I like we, how you said some money. Yeah, a lot of money. <laughs> and then they would, in return, promise not to produce nuclear weapons, which I think that was an example of Obama's utopitarian outlook on some foreign policy because it just did. I, I don't know why they would have stopped that. Like he helped stop them make nuclear weapons during yeah, his presidency and well, then but, still made but that they, deal. But that's the other thing, too. It kind of reminds me the Iran nuclear deal. And we're obviously going off on no, this, this, this now. Keep going. But the um, the Iran nuclear deal kind of looks to me, it's very similar to the the red line in Syria with Obama because that deal was made and they didn't, Iran didn't stop doing what they were doing. They just said, okay, the thing we're doing, we're not doing it for nuclear weapons anymore, but we're still doing it. Which, how does that make any sense? Uh, we're making nuclear weapons and here's how we're doing it. Okay, let's put a deal together so that you stop doing that. <laughs> St like stop making nuclear weapons. Okay, what are you guys doing over there? Same thing we were doing before. I know, but I thought we had a deal. Oh yeah, but we're not doing it to make nuclear weapons though. Doesn't make sense. It yeah. <laughs> doesn't make any sense, right? The Syria one is interesting though. My, my friend Joby Warwick, who I had in here for episode 134. The most fascinating terrorist figure I think I've ever come across. We're familiar with, with bin Laden. Bin Laden and, and Zawahiri, and his number two guy, they were of a completely different type. These were people who were professionals. Uh, bin Laden was an engineer. His number two was a medical physician, so they're educated, uh, sophisticated people. They have sort of a strategic vision of this terrorist organization they're trying to create. So Kali was none of that. He was just a street tough. He just wrote a book about that within the last couple of years called Redline. Okay. All about that and some of the some of the context there. But to me, like the big that one has a lot of different things going on, right. and, and I'm bringing them back in, and we're going to talk about that. But to me, the big, you know, it just never made sense, right? With, with and the Iran and thing. so then Iran used that and used kind of the the lift that that gave them. And obviously they pull along Hezbollah right along with them, you know, and they're, they're based out of, of Lebanon and, and all that kind of stuff. And so that's been building up as well. And recently over the last six, eight months, 
the northern border of Israel has seen a lot of issues with um, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and and I and I that's something that hasn't really been talked about. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. What I mean, like it, any towns in particular, cities? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I've shared the Google machine. If you put Israel conflict with yeah, Lebanon, let's see if you can look that up. Some stuff may pop up, but um, that's that's been a thing that's been escalating the last you know few months and. And it's like all this stuff, the signs have been there, you know, the, the signs have been there, things have been bubbling, but this, this thing that's going on right now is a massive coordination of various groups. Now, look, you have to remember a lot of these groups, when you're talking the Palestinian Authority, you're talking Islamic Jihad, and you're talking about Hamas, they don't get along. They don't, it's not like they all work together. You could say they have a common enemy, but politically and kind of territorially, they don't get along. What were the three there again? Palestinian Authority. Yep. Um, Islamic Jihad, which has a massive presence in Israel right now, especially in the West Bank, okay. and Hamas. Yeah. I, okay. I knew. I knew the Palestinian Authority and Hamas don't get along, but okay. Right. And 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 Islamic Jihad, they're kind of trying. Uh, they're newer to the space there, and they're trying to. Uh, they're really building. They they. They are, are have really had a lot of growth in the West Bank, particularly the northern areas of the West Bank. And they're more, I would imagine, like a, a bastardized religious fanatic. Yeah, they're kind of, it's probably not a great comparison, but they're kind of ISIS-y, kind of on that. It's hard to do. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, that's a whole other show, those guys, yeah. right? But um. But yeah, so, but they're, they're, and so obviously they're trying to get more stake in the game and they're trying to build themselves up and, but, but they don't, those three groups don't like each other, but this is involving all of them. And it's not like they all just woke up today and decided, Hey, we're going to do our thing today. So oh, they are. No shit. Together. We're, we're doing our thing today. Yeah. Hey, we're going to do ours today as well. Right. And this has been a coordinated thing. Um, so why do you think they're just because they're like enemy and my enemy is my friend? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you could have, um, well, the other thing is money, right? If Iran comes in and gets the three of them at the table and says, hey. Here you go. Yes, I have a plan, but I need you guys to kind of put your differences aside. We need to do this together. Maybe that's how that kicked off, right? Um, but they definitely, there's no coincidence in this. They obviously did it, those groups. And there's probably other groups involved as well. I mean, we talked about Hezbollah, but obviously that's kind of a given when you have Iran involved. Um, there, there may be other little splinter groups that have connected in as well, but this has been a big coordinated thing. There's, um, I was talking to someone um, this morning as well that, who who is big in this space and 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 knows what he's talking about and is involved in uh, here and in, in New York and in Israel and his opinion initially was um you know maybe this was something that was actually planned and set up outside of Gaza outside of the West Bank outside mm. of Israel because and here's why because of the intelligence apparatus you know, and, and Israel does a fantastic job of, just as any very good intelligence service does, they do a fantastic job of being in places and making the relationships that you need to make on an intelligence basis to get information. Yeah, because this thing this morning, it seems Surprise. like this massive intelligence failure, which they it's, got the best intelligence services in the world. It's Pearl Harbor, right? And I mean, and in the West Bank, obviously the Gaza stuff, trying to get trying to get whether it's Shin Bet or some of these other organizations that Israel has involved in Gaza can be very difficult, right? But in the West Bank, they run rampant in there and mm -hmm. they they have tons of connections within the Palestinian Authority and and all this kind of stuff, right? I mean it's 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 a fascinating kind of if you want if you if you like that kind of stuff, dig into kind of Israel's comings and goings when it comes to intelligence in the oh, West yeah. Bank. Um, but how was this missed? And, you know, when when he said that to me, and I was on, on the plane on the way over and we're going back and forth. Um, when he said that to me, 
my first thought was kind of like, but even if that was planned somewhere else, like let's say you, you grab all the leaders or you grab all the, the, the commanders or whoever's going to actually be operational in this thing, and let's just say you take them to Iran or you take them to some third country, you know, uh, where where you can plan this kind of thing, right? And I still think it would get out. I still think somebody back in, in, in the Gaza Strip, somebody in the West Bank, somebody in I Israel agree. would hear that this was going on and it would get out. That was my first, you know, little tinfoil thought that popped in my head this morning, just because I know how amazing Mossad, Amman, and then to an extent Shimpet are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how the fuck couldn't they have known about this? Like that doesn't, to me, it's possible, but it's like you hear that and you're thinking... All the coordinate, and you're even telling me about more coordination than I got to see because this happened like this was happening this morning right, right before he came in. So like right. I'm walking in here very like yeah before I even it. got like, out of the car we're talking holy about holy shit. <laughs> but like all that coordination, they don't know anything. Now let me put on my strategy hat for a second and remove, you know, just thinking about every little thing that could happen on the way. But like there is a way you could use that. Right, so if if there's going to be some violence to start to kind of suck them into it, and then I'm I'm just thinking military strategy right, right here, and then you can obliterate them. That would be an in, some people wouldn't like that, of course, yeah, like publicly, but, but that would be a military type intelligence op. But I just think, and and here's the thing, and here's kind of the difference between say the government in the Gaza Strip and the government in Israel proper is, and, and I believe this as well is. Really, the only job of government is to protect the people. Yes. Right? The government's terrible at doing pretty much everything. <laughs> everything. The government's terrible at doing it, right? They, you tell me one thing that you want the government to do, and I could probably show you 100 companies, private companies that could do it better to, to facilitate that community or that whatever, right? The government's pretty terrible at everything. But... The government certainly, in my opinion, has a has a obligation to protect its people. Obviously, you don't see that in in the in in the Gaza Strip. Israel, I think, if you asked most kind of you just walked up to random people, you'd say Israel's government cares about the Israeli people. They they work for the protection of the Israeli sure. people, right? The reason I don't think they would take the stance of like you kind of suggested with a tinfoil hat. I know it's not really your stance. You're just kind of throwing it's it out there. It's not to be clear, right? But yeah. Um, that they're kind of dangling this out there to draw them in is if, if I had previous knowledge that they were going to do stuff like this to civilians, I mean, they're going into houses and taking, oh, it's horrible. and just taking women out and goodness knows what they're going to do with them when they get them back to wherever they're going. God forbid. But I don't think I would, dangle my people out there like that as a carrot to lure the enemy in. I think, I mean, if that was kind of the thing, this is on the, this is on the, the kind of the, the, the game plan sheet here of what they're going to do when they come in. Okay. We can't use that as a strategy. We can't do the lure them in so we can punch them in the face kind of strategy there because of what their game plan is. I mean, and maybe they knew some things and they didn't know it was going to be quite this bad. I mean, that's, yeah. that's very possible. There's the other one on the screen there where they have that IDF, the, oh, the female, woman. Yeah, yeah, the female IDF soldier and they're, you know, look. They got her in the trunk. Yeah. How'd they get it? Do we know how that happened? How they got her? I, I think she was, she's an IDF soldier. I don't think, and just from looking at it, she's obviously not in uniform. And right. I don't know, right? I could be right. talking out of my backside, but she probably was home for the holidays and um, they snatched her from wherever they snatched her and she just happens to be an IDF soldier. Yeah, lives right along the border, something like that. Wow. So what does this look like though? Like you, you gave somewhat of an image of it. Like there's the sky, the sea, the the north border, the east border, right. the, the, the south border. What? When this started, I guess like overnight our time, but early this morning over there. Right. Did they? Did, I don't know how many details you know yet, because you were yeah. literally checking with your boys, like right as we're going on camera. But did they start this like at dawn? Was there a set number of soldiers in certain places, or was it all like kind of uh, street warfare tactics? I'm, like I'm trying to think what time it was last night. So um, 
a friend of mine, Trey Yingst, he, um, you know, if, if you're not following Trey Yingst, follow him and he'd be great for you to get on the podcast. He's the um, Fox News uh, foreign war correspondent. Um, he's an incredible guy, incredible journalist. He's flying up. Um, you know, he's, he's the best in the game right now. Um, and I saw him putting out some stuff on Instagram um, late last night, Chicago time. So it was early morning in Israel. I'm trying to think what time that was, just so we get timeline straight. Say maybe 11, 11.30 Chicago time. So you're talking nine, eight, 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 nine hours, yeah. you know? So you're talking very early in the morning. And I mean, the sun was up and, and he was at his apartment. He just went out on his balcony. Um, I, and I know it was his apartment. I know where he lives. And he's getting, you know, I mean, the rockets are going, the Iron Dome's kicking off, you know, and, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm not giving away where he lives or anything like that, but he lives in Tel Aviv and he's obviously Tel Aviv is near the sea, right? right? right. Um, it, it's right there um, where Tel Aviv for you guys, if you don't know where it is, um, uh, it's it's on the uh, west side of Israel, right on the sea. Yeah, can and, you just pull up that map for people, Alessi, so that they know? But. And um, all that was happening kind of right there and you're hearing the explosions in the background. And I mean, he's, you know, he's kind of looking around as he's talking, trying to get this report. He's just doing it on his iPhone. So it started, obviously, previous to that, because I'd imagine he'd have to try and gather his head and try and get as much information as possible before he just runs out on his balcony. And so, I don't know, you're talking, yeah, very early in the morning, probably dawnish, right? Right. And what does it look like? Like, we've seen the videos, that, to me, it looks like a lot of, like, urban warfare just... Yeah, so they fired about... Well, not um, that one. Yeah, so let's talk about this one. That is a brigadier general in the IDF. All right, we'll put this in the corner of the screen. And, and these Hamas operatives have went in and captured him. And this happened this morning. I don't really know what has happened with this story. Again, since all last night, I was following everything with our guys. I really didn't sit in front of any coverage. I think the coverage would be lagging at that point anyway. I'm talking to guys in Israel, you know, I, because I'm just, now it's like, okay, I just have to wait. I left my house this morning at 2.30 a.m. to mm. go to the airport to get here. And obviously I'm trying to follow as much as I can using kind of the channels we have and, and looking at social media. Um, then I'm on the plane. <laughs> so so I haven't sat down and been able to like hear any news reports, not that I think they could be totally reliable. And and our guys' heads are spinning over there. So I, I don't have a ton of like, I mean, and we're sitting in here talking now. Right, right. right. We, we're not getting all of this right now. Well, Alessi, can you see if there's an update on that IDF general? Yeah, and so they fired about now 5,000 rockets. It's probably more, but last I saw before we started the podcast, 5,000 rockets. It was around, to give some context, context when I left my house at 2.30, it was around 2,000 rockets. Mm. So in the time it took me to get from my house to, to get to you, 3,000 more rockets, which that's a lot, right? And how much is the Iron Dome catching of that? The, night, the Iron Dome, the Iron Dome's fantastic. We actually went to an Iron Dome battery and saw it and, and got to talk to some of the soldiers that work on it and stuff. Yeah, it, we, we've it, actually, we've talked about this on the podcast, oh, but can incredible. you also just explain it to people who haven't heard that before? Yeah, the, the Iron Dome is basically, um, they use HIMARS. It's a, it's a, it's a missile and, and mortar kind of intercepting um, apparatus. Um and, and it uses HIMARS, but what's so incredible about it is the technology behind it as far as um, the algorithms that it uses. If, if a missile's launched from Gaza, it can pick up, obviously, the trajectory of that rocket, but it will know, it can do the calculation very, very quickly, and it can know if that's going to land in a field, mm. in which case they just leave it and let it land in the field, or if it's going to land in a populated area. If it's calculated it's going to land in a populated area, they fire up a HIMAR and intercept it. And it's about 90% accurate. But again, you uh, the HIMAR missile system, and regardless of how many batteries you have, um, hold on, because there's some stuff. Yeah. Okay. So regardless of how many batteries you have or you think they may have, on the other side, on the terrorist side, you can do a calculation and say, okay, if it's 98% or if it's 90% accurate, how many missiles do I have to fire up to get a couple to land? Right. Right. And so you can do those calculations. 5,000 well. might do the trick. Yeah. So, so, yeah, probably. So some are getting through. It's not like it used to be, obviously. 
right? And that's why now, and they never used to fire this many, that this is the reason why they do fire this many. Back when all that was happening in March and April, back in Stay Rote, when Stay Rote got the most of the, the rockets and stuff, um, you know, they fired, I think, 8,000 in 48 hours or something like that. Like, mm. it, be, because they, and it sounds terrifying and it is, but the Iron Dome is able to get 90% of that, right? And then some of it, they're going to land in fields and all this. But, I mean, people got killed during that last kind of thing and people are getting killed here with these yeah. Rockets and stuff from Gaza. So yeah, we'll stick that video right there in the corner. Of the but yeah, the, the Iron Dome is an incredible, um, an incredible thing. Um, you know, I'm not. This is not telling any kind of secret or anything. But there is, and, and the other thing about the Iron Dome is it's, um, it's mobile. They can move it anywhere. They have batteries that they can move anywhere. There is a semi-permanent battery, um, in the Gaza region. How how big is it again? Like how far can it stretch? Uh, I don't know exactly. I want to say a couple of thousand. I, I don't know. You'd have to, it's a HIMAR system. So you'd have to look um, up the specs for a HIMAR. I was never an artillery guy or anything like that. So <laughs> I don't know. I love artillery. I think it's amazing, but I, I've never really been a, um, I know they're really dodgy on the specs, but at some point it, they do use HIMARS. So, and you can see it right there. Yeah, that's, that's an iron right. dome battery there. Um, right. So we'll put yeah, that picture in the corner. Whatever the specs are on a HIMAR, please, um, you military people watching this that know the specs of a HIMAR, don't kill me on this. <laughs> I just don't know. I'm not a rocket guy or a missile guy. All the guy. military guys are so into their terms, too. I like know. When someone I, yeah. fucks it up, they're yeah, like, that just, guy can never talk again. I know. I just don't know the... But but look, I've been to the battery, and, and I guarantee you most of you have not, right? Um, <laughs> and, I, and I've kind of had the tour and got to spend time with some of the, the soldiers, the, the young soldiers that actually work... Um, in the Gaza region, they are defending with the Iron Dome. Um, we talked about it early on in this podcast a little bit with some details, uh -huh. but we've been jumping around so much on so many things flying around in the situation. It's not a normal podcast. It's not, but it's I love this. I just want to make sure people <laughs> follow as well. So you had discussed how six months around six months ago, you first went to Israel yep. and you talked about like some of the team members and stuff going there, but like what your latest times there, what have your specific missions been like the last one or two times you've been there? So, um, when we went there, here's how we got involved in Israel. When, when the last, um, missile attacks happened back in March, um, of this year, I was talking to a friend and said, um, man, I'd love to get involved in something in Israel. Number one, you know, I believe in Israel. My faith is based in Israel. There's a huge humanitarian crisis there with a lot of what goes on with the Palestinian people and the victims of terrorism that go on there. Um, so it's, it's perfect for what we do, right? There's the counterterrorism aspects. There's the humanitarian aspect. I'd love to get there. But it, to me, it was like impossible. Now, when we do what we do, whether it's going to Ukraine or going to um, Israel or some of these other places that we're looking at going and even going to hurricanes to some degree, you need people in those locations to help kind of be your fixers, to help you. It's great to have an idea. I'm going to go to Africa and save the whales or whatever it is that you're, you think you're going to do, right? Um, but how do you make that happen? You, yeah. You can come out and you need people in those locations. In... in, in um, in Ukraine, it happened very organically because we didn't go there for that reason. Um, and, and that network now we've cultivated and we have these guys that are movers and shakers and can put us where we need to be and in front of people that we need to see and all this kind of stuff. But it's very hard to kind of cultivate that your own. You can't just show up in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem and be like, hey, we're these guys and we want to do this. People are, who are you going to talk to? Yeah, How, and the IDF is obviously very insulated israel is very insulated for all kinds of reasons it's it you can't just go over there and knock on the door and i didn't have anybody i know a lot of people in israel but i didn't have anybody that could help with that kind of stuff and i was talking to this guy i said i'd love to do it i just i've i have i'd have to really figure this out and he goes actually i know a guy maybe he can help us so i was like okay go pull on that thread and we'll see didn't have too much hope you know and uh 
sure enough, that was kind of our way in there to, to get connected. Um, was this a government connected guy? This was a military connected guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we, we got connected there with a special tactical vehicle unit and with the IDF and we went there and on the first, on the first trip, it was funny. I, you know, I took, um, you know, a, a medic, a green beret, and then, um, uh, a, a, a recon guy, another recon Marine. And we went and the first day we arrive, we're at the beach in Tel Aviv. Now, if you've never been to Tel Aviv, it's like Miami, right? right? It's like Miami. It is no shit like Miami. And then I showed them the contrast between Jerusalem, which is obviously very, very different, right? And there's a lot of tent. Jerusalem's one of the greatest places. If you've never been to Jerusalem, go. And I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your views on Israel are in. Well, it's, it's all the religions it's, there. It's, it's yeah. an incredible place to go and, and to see. And the history there is obviously. And so you see the contrast there. And then, so now we're going to go meet up with these guys. And it was at the Gaza border, right? And it was at night. So we were basically doing like a, a night patrol on the Gaza border with this unit and getting kind of the, the layout of what's going on there. We went up on, remember I told you about that guy who does the farming down there? Yes. So they have these two or multiple, but they have these ramps where when he would go out to basically just plow his fields or to harvest his fields, He'd have to call the IDF. They would put two tanks up on these big ramps overlooking mm. the fields and they'd put Israeli snipers all along the berm line because his workers were getting shot at from Gaza, from the Hamas um, snipers. Outposts. Yeah, from the outposts. And so he'd have to have that up there just to plow his freaking field. That's nuts, man. Now that's not happening everywhere else. Right, like you, again, you, we back to our previous conversation. Oh, but the but this, but this, but this, but they did this, but they did that. That's not happening on the other side. That's not right. happening on the other side, right? So we went and saw some of that. Um, we and, got, and by the way, just for context for people, I think I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to make sure for people that aren't following all your long credentials here, we're probably going to end up doing a separate podcast on Ukraine <laughs> because this this we're going to keep yeah, going this with is, this for this a while. Kicked off, yeah. This is great. But your your foundation, the Overwatch Foundation, is something that you formed when the Ukraine war broke out because you are an ex recon marine for twelve years, and we'll talk about later how you got involved over there. Right. But just as like, just for people to have an idea, what what's the general mission of the Overwatch Foundation? Yeah, so we use former special operations guys, veterans, to um, basically conduct humanitarian missions in crisis areas. So we do a lot of stuff with natural disasters here in the States. Um, and that's kind of what got us, what got us started before we were the Overwatch Foundation was the Afghan pullout. We were involved mm. in that. Um, and then we did hurricane relief and we do like zero hour hurricane relief. We're there right when the shit hits the fan um, and and try and get involved in, in, in really helping people during those really you know, disaster type right. times. Um, then we went to Ukraine and, and it's just kind of, you know, we, we have obviously Israel is a big part of what we do now. We're looking to do stuff with in Africa. We're looking at some stuff with the border. We're, we're looking at uh, South America as well. Um, we're just anywhere where there's kind of crisis and people in need. We want to take groups of highly trained former special operators and put their, skill set and experience back to work to help people. Mm. And that's kind of the layman's terms of, of kind of what we do. If you want to read our official mission statement, it's on the website. Yeah, link kind of in stuff. description. But that's but that's um that's what we do and and it was just something that I didn't have this idea. And we can talk about it later. I didn't have this idea. It just kinda of happened. It just right. kinda of, just fell into it. And then I really started to see what the guys could do and what, what, you know, getting, getting these little bands back together and, and, you know, just winding people up and letting them go and seeing what we could accomplish in a very small team, you know, and, and it's working. We've kind of proven yeah. the concept and we're just, we're just looking to replicate it and, and to do it more and more. It's been really, really amazing. And so, you know, Israel was something that 
it happened very fast because of the the contacts we could make there and or the contact that we that we had there and, and we've developed that and so yeah that first one it was border operation like uh patrol on the gaza border are you advi- are you because again we're going to talk about what you do in ukraine I'm, I'm much more familiar with that but are you training israel official israeli forces there or are you advising like the civilians what they can do to counteract some of these dangers like what's the roles um so i can't say everything that we're doing in israel right now just for a bunch of reasons as you can imagine some of what we do it's not like we're doing anything illegal we're not doing anything gray um it's just kind of opsec and safety and and obviously we have this connection to these groups that are really what we've done there you know here here's when we went the first time i got a phone call with these guys and so i'm on this call and they're like okay so we know who you are but what are you trying to do and i kind of didn't have an answer yet that's what the call was to determine and i'm like well i don't know but we can help you and they're like (laughs) well no one's ever done this before and i was like that's the point like Mm. that's the thing that's why we're going to be able to do something because it's never been done. And I don't know what the it is yet, but let's figure it out. And Israelis, you know, they do have that Middle Eastern mentality where, you know, it's just a different culture, right? So I said, look, nothing's going to get done on these Zoom calls. I'm just going to hop on a plane, grab some dudes and go over and get in front of these guys. And and they'll see who we are and what we can do. And we'll go do some stuff within and we'll figure it out. It'll develop from there because it's not going to happen on a Zoom call. And, and so that's what we did. We went, we took a bunch of um, gear there to help various people um, on a humanitarian side and um, showed up and, and right away it just kind of all clicked. And, you know, we, we're not right now, as I sit here, we're not doing the same kind of training in Israel as we do in Ukraine. Right, right. We are... It's it's an ongoing thing. We're still building out the relationship. We're still we're doing a lot of stuff there. We've done a lot of stuff there, um, and we're we're it's new. It's much the Ukraine mission that we have is much more developed because we've been doing it more. Right, and you're and you guys are obviously an independent foundation. You're not any not, part of the United States government or nope, something. And, and we're not on a contract with anybody. Everything we do, we're offering. Um, you know. To, to certain groups, we're offering our experience, our skill set um, to help whoever it is we're helping, um, you know, in whatever way we can help. We don't have a contract with the Israeli government. We don't have a contract with the Ukrainian government. When we go to a hurricane, like, say, in Florida, we don't have any contract with FEMA or or the state of Florida gotcha. or anything like that, right? Um, it's a lot of the times it's it's obviously we have some donors that help us. And a lot of time it's me trying to, you know, scrummage around in my bank account, trying to find money to, to make sure we can just go help people. Um, and we are, we are, you know, we've helped a lot of people. We've saved, we've saved lives in Israel. We've saved lives in, in Ukraine. Um, Have you saved live, lives in Israel, like from stuff coming in from the border there? Um, so the one unit that we work with does counterterrorism operations on all of the borders of Israel, the Jordanian border, everywhere in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, um, Gaza, and um, Egypt. And this is and, an official and military? Yep, okay. yeah. Um, and so we've given them, we've kind of given them our experience and our, some gear, like some tier one level gear um, that has kind of plussed them up to and and they've you know used that i mean when we went on that first trip to where we did the gaza patrols we left on a tuesday and on saturday two of those guys in that unit got killed down in the egypt border right terrorist was at the checkpoint and just started opening fire and you know they were there doing some counterterrorism stuff and got caught up in, in that exchange. Like a border checkpoint you're talking about? Yeah, like um, the way they, they have like kind of multiple checkpoint kind of things going there. Um, and yeah, this person was crossing to kill as many people as he could. They obviously go- took care of him, but um, two of the guys got killed there mm-hmm. as well. So, I mean, it's, and I mean, yeah, it's nuts. I mean, we were in those vehicles a few days before, you know. Um, 
so I mean, it's real, right? I mean, these guys are really experienced in it. And and we went when we went and did the tour of Gaza. We um, the the border there. We went to that location where the terror tunnel incident happened. We, you know, we kind of saw. Uh, in this one border town everything that had happened and all that and so it's like okay we can help these people we can help on the humanitarian side for sure right i mean um that's kind of the, the humanitarian stuff in my opinion the easy stuff it's it's helping people at a very high level it's 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 easy to get out of bed in the morning and do that right mm -hmm. then we went back and when we went back the second time I took another recon guy and a, a GRS guy. He, he um, when he got done in recon, he went to GRS. Um, he, me and him went and we did, um, we went to Gaza and we did a little bit different stuff down there. We went to like the actual um, command post for the IDF for the all of the Gaza region. And um, really got to see some under the table, behind the curtains kind of stuff um that the idf does in that region and it was that was impressive that was very cool we were very honored to you know to, to to be there and to and to be a part of that and see that and have that connection with them and it was like geez these guys really are interested in us kind of thing like we can help them and they're really interested like they're up for it and then uh, um the second half of that trip was when we went to the west bank and we did a couple of different patrols there one was with the idf um on the border fence of, of the West Bank, which was, you know, we were in the area of Sharif, which is a terrorist shithole. Um, and I have no problem saying that on the internet or whatever. Yeah, can we show that on the map, um, Alessi? Sharif, S-H-A-R-E-E-F? Yeah, S-U-R. Fuck that up. S-U-R-I-F, I guess. Try that. Google Maps. West Bank. And, yeah. Sharif. Yeah. So this is this is right along the border of this town. Um, this is in the West Bank, so it's it's right, right along, along the border, the border of, of the West Bank. Bank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and if it, we get it, we'll put. And, it, in and the it was it was funny too because when we got there, we we went there that morning to that IDF outpost, and the unit we were going to go out with um, was still sleeping because they had been out the night before on an op, and were there was a ton of engagements and all that, so they were like, hey. They need, a, they need a couple, you know, can you guys hang out and go get breakfast or something? They need a little more sleep. They've been up all night, like, mm. you know, running and gunning. So we were like, okay, so it gave us a chance to meet a bunch of more people and all that. And then we went out with them um, and, and kind of saw some of the border operations that they do there and, and the infiltrations of that border with money. and Because uh, an Israeli shekel in Israel and an, an Israeli shekel in the West Bank have two completely different values mm. because of the corruption and because of the the you know the the kind of politics of the of the West Bank and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we saw how they smuggle weapons and and people. Right? They they have people in the West Bank that are hey you can't leave and go into Israel because you're a terrorist. But then they'll sneak those people into how do Israel. they do that? Uh, different ways of how they beat the fence. Um, you know, they do stuff where they'll throw big rocks over, they'll cut the fence, they'll sneak under it or over it. And I mean, you look at it and you're like, how in the world do they get through this fence? And the West Bank is very mountainous, it's very rugged, it's not um, easy terrain at all. Mm. Um, and that's where that tactical vehicle unit that we work with really helps those IDF kind of outposts because they use bigger vehicles and that are cumbersome and can't get through that terrain where the tactical vehicle unit can is really nimble and agile and can uh, the capability is unbelievable um and so they can help intercept some of that counterterrorism stuff on these border areas you know and, and that's kind of primarily where they use those well the one thing i can't really wrap my head around with all this you're talking about vis-a-vis -vis israel and what you're doing there is that like i understand you are an American, you're an American veteran, they're a huge ally and everything, but you're like a private organization. You've been over there like six months now, it's not that long. And it seems to me like they're bringing, they're trusting you and bringing you in on some pretty high level type things that they're gonna play close to the chest. Like what, why are they doing that? Um, it's surprising. Yeah, I mean, look. <sighs> 
it, it does kind of sound uh, surprising. We're obviously excited about it and grateful to, to be working there because their assistance is going to help us on the humanitarian side in a massive way. The reason um, that it shouldn't sound so unique and, and, and so just kind of weird to, to the average civilian is you have to remember as military, we often train with foreign militaries mm -hmm. and work with foreign militaries on, on, on different stuff, a lot of different training trips and, and things like that. So I'm not saying that's what this is, but it can look and feel like that. And so it's not, it's not unique to them. It's not unique to us. Once, once we get rolling in, in the connection and, or the relationship, it just kind of feels that way. Mm -hmm. And it's not a foreign concept to be working with people from another military. The other thing in the IDF, you have to remember the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, their military, has a lot of American influence through partnership, obviously one of our greatest allies, but a lot of Americans go and enlist in the IDF. Jewish Americans oh, right, right. go back yeah. and they do two years or, or longer and you know they make out or people maybe they make aliyah to to israel like they go and, yes. and they and they live in israel and they join the reserve units um and and they they so so there is a lot of influence there connected to america american military and all that kind of stuff um you know i it does kind of sound weird it's kind of like when when we first went to ukraine and got asked if we would help and train those those guys the, the first time, you know, Zach and I, uh, an another one of the, the recon sniper guys that we have on our team, we just kind of said, yes, we'll help you. And then when we got back to where we were staying, we kind of looked at each other and said, is this even legal? Like, can we, right. can we do this, right. you know? Um, and we didn't know. And, and it's kind of the same in, in Israel. I mean, you know, I haven't had a knock on the door from anybody. Nobody's called me and said, hey, what are you doing over there or anything like that. Um, we're, we're, we're not doing anything nefarious over there. We're not directly involved in any combat or, or anything like that. I mean, and look, could we be? Oh, the guys the guys we have now, and it's, it's very funny, um, a lot of the guys we have now are better operators than they probably were when they were with their teams. Mm. And and I I probably not on a physical level, although if you, if even if I think about myself, I'm a much stronger individual than I was. I'm probably not as fit as far as swimming and running, right? Like I'm, I'm not like that, but smarter, kind of more experienced, still training, using a lot more kind of modern's not the right word, but kind of new technology that's out there for whether it's weapons or gear or whatever. And, and you know, a lot of our guys have their own training companies. And, and so they're, they're developing their skill set more so than what they had when they were actually in a team. And as opposed to, say, like the Ukraine situation we'll talk about in a little bit on probably the next podcast, but as opposed to that, in Israel, the way I'm reading this, correct me if I'm wrong, it's more of like a adding riches to riches here like they they obviously have great systems unbelievable technology yeah. incredibly capable military they're just looking for any possible edge they could get and you guys with the american perspective can give that yeah and that and that's kind of i don't want to say that's all it is on that side of it but that is it we're not over there and and look even though like i said our guys are really still shit hot um and some of them have been out for a few years some have only been out a couple of years um you know, and we have tier one guys, right? And, and on our teams, we're not trying to get involved in combat. It's the same in Ukraine. We're not trying to do that. We've done all that. And, and um, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to help whoever needs help. If it's a foreign, you know, again, when we say foreign military, that's a thing, <laughs> obviously. But to me, if I go to Ukraine or I go to Israel and I'm standing there with a Ukrainian soldier who two weeks ago was a baker or a car mechanic at that point right. in that war and or someone in the IDF, it's just another, it's just a guy. It's just a, it's just a human being. It's a man. It's, it's somebody who's 
somewhat like-minded to me, somewhat like experience to me. And we're just sharing knowledge and, and ideas and we have a lot of similarities and I'm just trying to help that individual guy, right? It's not so much about my organization trying to help this other military. Like we're not mercenaries, we're not none of that, right? We're, it's more about the connection to that individual and how can I help him? It's, it's very different than the humanitarian side, obviously. When you see somebody in need, you see somebody who, who you can help out, you know, you think of whatever, a hurricane, food, water, shelter, um, you know, that kind of stuff, this program that we're trying to do in Israel, helping the Palestinian people in Gaza, um, that's easy. You, you can, that's simple, right? That's, it's very easy to see the line there and to see how you can help someone there. But yeah, it, it does kind of not shock a lot of people, but a lot of people can't seem to get their head around, yeah, but you're helping these foreign militaries. It's like, well, it's kind of not like that. Like if you were to ask me, I don't think I would say it that way. Mm. If you asked me on a, like a, like put it on an index card, I, I wouldn't really say it that way. Cause it's more about that individual and, and helping that individual. Because look, I've been there, I've done it. So have all the guys. We've been in a vehicle, we've kicked a door down. We've been in that house where it's like, regardless of the politics of this, you know, when, you know, regardless of what the president's doing, what the military objective is, what the objective in this city is, I'm here tonight and there's the 12 of us here and we have to get home. And what are we going to do to help each other? How are we going to do our job? I'm here for you. You're here for me. And, and that's it. It does at the end of the day to the individual man, it does boil down to that. And I mean, you've had guys on the podcast who have echoed that in various Absolutely. different ways. And and many people can't understand that. It's kind of like, and this is a throwback to, to the extreme opposite end of you think of when many people returned from Vietnam, mm. how they were just looked at, like that individual that was doing that thing over there day in and day out, and he comes back and the community hates him because he yeah. wore a green uniform. It had nothing to do with any of the politics or the this or that. And and like that's the opposite extreme of it, right? It's it's not about that. It's about the individual man. And look, I've been lucky enough to to be on some good teams and to to have good teammates that are way better than me and and been able to do some things that are, you know, very unique. And I hope that there's not a lot of humans that get to do those things because they're very heavy, right? But I've seen it and done it. And so then when you see someone else who's involved in that job right now and involved in those kind of, you know, that's their life right now, I can relate to that. And I know how that feels. And I know how difficult it is for, for, my, for myself and for my friends. And so if I can help that person just a wee bit to like whatever, if it's give them some advice, if it's to, you know, give them a, a little tactical knowledge here or there, or just to encourage them or just to try and, you know, whatever it is, I think man to man, that goes a long way in that line of work. Absolutely. You know, and so a lot of it is just that we see, especially in Ukraine, it's crazy because those guys are not soldiers. They're average yeah. citizens who are being handed a rifle and in two weeks told that they're going to go do this. And war is not supposed to be like that. <laughs> no. War no. is not supposed to be like that. Like I, I've said this multiple times, multiple places, you know, war should be, war is a terrible thing. It's a very, it's a very weird thing because it's absolutely terrible. It's horrendous, but it's very beautiful and there's a lot of honor in it as well, right? Why but do you say that? Just because of individual things that can happen in in say a firefight or in a four day fight to take over a town or in an operation to go get some shithead terrorist there. It's so vast of what can happen on something like that from something heroic. Right. And, 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 you know, I, I had a thing when I was in boot camp in the Marine Corps, you know, at the end of the three months, well, back when back when I was in back in the day when I <laughs> when I went to boot camp, it, it's probably completely different now. How everything's done, you hear bits and pieces, but it was the year two thousand. And at the end, you did this event called the Crucible, 
and it's like a three day kind of event and you get little sleep, you get little food and you have to do these obstacles and these kind of puzzles, you know, um, and, and various different things kind of putting all your basic training together. And at the end you climb this hill in Southern California and you're awarded your Eagle Globe and Anchor and you become a United States Marine. And it, it really was a cool thing. And then you come back down off the mountain and you eat steak and eggs for breakfast, the warriors breakfast. Right. And it's, it's it's like a really cool rite of passage and 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 all this kind of stuff and it kind of sets the tone for what for who you're going to be and 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 what you're going to become these guys say in Ukraine they don't have that they're handed a rifle and and it look when you come out of boot camp in the marine corps or you come out of of school of infantry you don't know anything you're basic you you haven't done anything yet right same as if you know you've had stories with other up like special operations guys on here they get done with their training whether it's navy seals recon guys army rangers or green berets the delta whatever you've just done this thing you get to where you're going and you're the low man on the totem pole you're, right. you've done nothing yet right it, like and and there's a there's a progression to that to developing you to get you to a level with people around you to to get you to a certain level Ukraine doesn't have that. And to some extent in Israel, just because of how they do their military, it's very young people. I was so surprised to see how young their military is. Well, they were, like you said earlier, they require at least two years of service for right. everyone. At, what is that, age 18? They have to do it? Yeah, 18. Yeah. And then I remember we, so we rolled into this tank outpost. And it was really funny, and, and like on the Patreon, I have a bunch of videos of this with me and Andy. We rolled into this tank outpost, and, and there was these young guys there, these young tankers, and they had kind of the Arba tanks, which is our equivalent of the, the, the Abrams tanks, and they had whatever their vehicle is. It's the equivalent of like the Bradley fighting vehicle. And we're looking around, it's like these young guys, like <laughs> crazy young guys. Like they had to still be teenagers or like 20, 21 years old at the max. And so I'm like, can I get a picture with a tank? So we're getting a picture. And I've never been in a tank. I've been in like fighting vehicles, but I've never actually been in like a hmm. battle tank like that. I mean, I there's no reason for me to ever be in a battle tank. But, um, and, and, and then I was like, can we go in the tank? And so they're like, yeah. So, so we jump in the tank and we have, you know, we're messing around with everything. We're checking out all the comm systems where, you know, and I just kept asking questions like, where are the, you know, can you show us the breach for the main gun and all this? And it's on there. It's really funny. And then they're handing Andy these big tank rounds, like the main gun rounds. And it's like, I don't know if this, like, you're just letting, you don't, they don't know us. We just rolled up to this. I mean, we were with guys. They obviously vouched for us. And then I'm asking, like, can I see the targeting computer? Can I do this? Can we turn the turret? Mm -hmm. Like, And so they're just kind of giving us a tour of this tank. And you're thinking, like, these guys are on patrol with this tank on the Gaza border three days a week. They do their patrols. And you're like, they're in it. And they're so young. Right. They're so young. We, obviously, in the Marine Corps, there's a lot of young guys. But it always seemed like your senior leadership was old and crusty and knew what to do. And, and, and I just don't really see, I mean, obviously in Ukraine, it's a totally different thing, but even in, in Israel, everybody, I was so impressed and so kind of almost shocked that everyone was so young and, and look, they're capable, fantastic, whatever, but I don't care how well trained you are, how, whatever, there's something to be said for experience. Yeah, and if you're that young, you just don't have the experience. At but that that's point. also anecdotally, that's some of the stuff you're seeing, right? Right, and so when you when you see guys like that though, and you know, look, these aren't guys hanging out at Camp Pendleton, you know, and then they go do a six month deployment, um, you know, in Africa, and yeah, look, it's dangerous, and that's great service and all this kind of stuff. I'm just I'm drawing the parallel that it's very different to when you sign up in Israel, right. and all of a sudden you're 19, 20 years old, and you're on the Gaza border in an Arba tank, and you have to go patrol four times yeah. a week, and something like this can kick off at any moment. That's a totally different reality for someone so young with no experience, you know, and and it breaks my heart a little bit when you see some of this stuff. And I mean, I showed you some of these pictures from some of those telegram channels. You see these young IDF soldiers laying in the street in a pool of blood, you know, in their underwear because they got woken up and grabbed their gear and tried to go out and do something. Someone's overrunning their, their outpost. 
and it just, it, it breaks your heart because you're like, did that guy have a chance? You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't have the experience and experience there is different than experience here. Sure, you can be young and get a ton of experience in a place like Israel because stuff's popping off all the time. But that's just a very difficult situation, you know, to be that young and to be faced with that kind of combat with very little experience. And, you know, and, and you see it all the time as well. And you're like, yeah, but those guys look young. Or how are these, some people have this mystique about the IDF and all this kind of stuff. You know, they are very good at what they do. They have to be, right? They're literally fighting for their survival. I, I've never fought for the survival of the United States. Well, do you, hold on a minute. On that note then, do you, you have quite the background, right? You're, you're a Scottish American Jew and you, on, on the third part of that, do you feel some of that connection? like heavily for like that survival you just said you don't necessarily say you did that for the united states because like again we're so big here it's a different history but like do you feel that yeah i mean look if you want to talk the jewish people in general you know and i'm not want to get into like say an ethnic jew who can trace themselves back to any of the 12 tribes or whatever but i'm just saying like in general you can crack open that book and you can see, you know, throughout history, that group of people have had to survive all kinds of different situations that were dire, right? The Assyrian uh, captivity, then the Babylonian captivity, and you just, you just keep going through and through and through. And, and obviously we talked about uh, just a little bit earlier, Holocaust and, and all this kind of stuff, and you just see a group of people that has literally had to fight for its survival, whether on an ethnic level or a, re a religious level throughout its history. And it's a small, relatively small group of people. And so, you know, to me, I don't live there. I don't care about their politics. Uh, you know, I, I don't care about, say, their, their, how, how they do government. The stuff that you and I might complain about, taxes or this or this or that, I don't care about any of that in Israel. But I care about the land, I care about the people, and I care about the history, right? You know, this is a, this is a, a the people that live in that land had everything, their language taken from them, mm -hmm. right? Your language taken from you. That's a wild history too, how they re- integrate yes. that not one, long ago one man unreal one man and his family right went yep. went to israel and said okay we're getting off the boat and we're no longer gonna speak i think he was jabotinsky German. was it uh, who did that i can't remember exactly i don't think it was jabotinsky no it was, it was not one, it was one but of, yeah. said we're not and and look the only hebrew there was no modern hebrew at that time the only hebrew they were speaking was biblical hebrew Right. Which, you know, you n many people in Israel can't speak biblical Hebrew or, you know, it's, it's very, it's very different than the modern Hebrew. And, and just the, 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 the revival of that language where they have committees that even recently they've had to sit down and create new words. Yeah. Yeah. There was like limited, uh, uh, I forget the number, but yeah. And, and, and even just based on how their language functions, we don't have it, but like how the different roots work together it has to be a certain way and all this kind of stuff and so it's like we don't have a word for this we can't just make one up or adopt it from somewhere else like we like an english does is just we don't have a word for that adopt it how, how do the french say it? how you know what i mean we just take the word where they kind of would recreate or create words for modern things that never existed in the language and they did it through the proper function of the language i mean it's i don't think that I'm sure some other country probably has had to do something like that, but I can't think of it. I can't think of another example like that. Not in modern history. And, and, so when, and so when you look at this kind of stuff, and it doesn't really matter about being Jewish. It doesn't really matter about being observant. I mean, you could connect it to being a Christian, right? If, for all intents and purposes, you could look at it that way. There is something different about that country. I've been lucky enough. I've been able to travel all over the world. I've seen amazing places, right? Like I said, Iraq, 
I've been to Iraq and, and probably Iraq's one of its worst times in history. Um, it's an incredible country. The people are amazing in Iraq. Um, the average person that I met was incredible. Baghdad was, uh, I wish I could have seen it, you know, 40 years ago. And I hope in the next 40 years before God, you know, takes me that I can go back there like people go back to Normandy or whatever right. and just see how beautiful it is. Because it's an incredible place, you know. Um, and you could just see how beautiful it was when, when you're in, when you're in a place like Baghdad. And, and, the, and the countryside of Iraq and everything, it's amazing. I've been all over. But there is something very different about Israel. Like, you know you're there, you know what I mean? And, and just the history that's there. And I mean, even you go to Jerusalem and you look at the Temple Mount and you just, you, you know. And, when, and for me, when I go to the Temple Mount and, you know, and I believe the temple should still be there, right? It was there before those other two buildings were there for sure. You can't argue that. Um and I, and I don't want to piss anybody off talking about that. That's probably a very volatile situation. I'm not saying we should knock those two buildings down and, and do that. I'm just saying, right? But you know you're there and you know, you know, what went on on that mountain. And you know, kind of, you, you just, there's a different feel to being in that land than there is any other country I've ever been to. You know, it's, it's very, and, and look, I've taken people there on our teams that are not religious at all in any way, shape or form. I've taken guys there that are very, say, Texas Christian, let's say, mm -hmm. right? Um, they have a weird kind of connection when you're there. It's just, and, and I mean, you could look this up, it sounds very woo, but there is just a weird thing about that land and being there. It's the most historical place in the yeah. world. I mean, you look at it and there's different, uh, there's obviously different time periods and different mm -hmm. types of histories here, but you know, you look at Israel, you look at Egypt, that, that is the oh. middle of everything. And it, and it is the middle of like where the world even split apart from way right. back, you know, going way past human history. But right. it's, it's a crazy thing to me. And I, I look at, I always look at other cultures and, and realize like I can never understand because right. I wasn't born into it. Right. I don't, I don't know what it feels like to have that ingrained in me at 18 months old, you know, when I'm right. hearing my first words and, and stuff like that. But, you know, we had hinted at it earlier a little bit, but there, there is such an ingrained survival instinct within the Jewish people and within the Israelis that, that, that we see there today because of how close they've come over and over and over again to being wiped off the face of the earth. Well, look at today, right? Imagine waking up today in Israel and you don't fight back. Yeah. We're, we're 10 hours into this. What would happen, right? What would happen if they couldn't fight back or, or if the country didn't fight back? Look at what they're doing, right? We just had the break. We're looking. More stuff's coming out. We're trying to get pieces of it here and there. But if nobody fought back, nobody tried, you know, precision strikes back into Gaza. Nobody's kicking down doors, you know, in these towns in the south or all this kind of stuff, what happens? There'd be no Israel. Yeah. Like they're lead and, and if and if we woke up this morning and Hamas and all these other groups didn't do this encouraging and didn't start this war, it would just be another day in Israel. Right? Yeah. Israel's not trying to go into Gaza and destroy everybody and and you know, do all this and, and kidnap people from, from buildings and take them back into Israel or shoot them in the streets. And that's not happening, you know? And so when you want to talk about survival, that's an example. Like, that's what we're talking about, yeah. you know? And, and you're seeing it on real, real time, right? On, on, on Instagram, it's unbelievable, you know? And, and the same thing happened. You could take this time and period. It happened. You could take that time and period. It happened. We're just getting to watch it now because we have, because we have Instagram, you know. So, yeah. it's 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 crazy. It, it really it's hard to get your head around that. Why do you think you know, it, it's such a strange thing about humanity around the world and how we have all these different groups of people, races, religions, creeds, whatever? It's a strange thing to me that even today in our very globally interconnected world, there is still intensive tribalism that then 
leads to call it what it is. You know, there's some severe racism around the world. We have it here in America in, in some ways, in some places. You know, there's there's this thing where human beings look at another human being who's the same as them and just looks a little different on the outside or right. believes something different, and they have intensive hatred for it. And when you look at, like, the 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 Jewish people around the world, it seems like anti-Semitism, the fervor of it and the consistency of it that exists even sometimes in small places everywhere never subsides. What? Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think... And and that's the funny thing as well is I don't understand that, right? Like, I, I don't understand what your objective is. Right. If, you know, whether, like you said, color, this, that, or next thing. So what do you want then? Like, if you don't want those, or you want everyone to be like you. Like, let's say there are some sects of Islam that says the convert or die thing. And we've seen that throughout history, right? And you could say it didn't happen, whatever, it happened. And it's probably, it's still a thing. ISIS did that, right? The convert or die thing. Uh, yeah. So... But I don't understand that. Like, I don't understand why you would, what, why if, if you are that convert or die person putting that out there, why do you need that to happen? Why do you want that to happen? Why, why can't I be different than you? Yeah. If I'm not trying to kill you for any kind of reason or get rid of you and you can live over there and I can live over here, what's with the convert or die thing? And then I'm just using that as an example. There's tons of other examples, right? I'm just using that one. I'm not picking on anybody or any No, I know religion. exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah, but we're on the interwebs. <laughs> so you have to put that disclaimer out they're there. They're always, they're going to pick apart some stuff every time. But man. things like that, I just don't understand. And it's very funny in the Marine Corps, obviously you have a lot of young guys coming together, you know, leaving their house for the first time when they enlist and they go to basic training and all this. And you have all kinds of different races and, and, and everything there, right? And you're kind of taught that there's no white Marine, there's no yellow Marine, there's no black Marine, there's no, you know, brown Marine, everybody's just green, right? Mm. And if you want, you can say you're dark green or you can say you're light green or whatever, but you're still, you're still green. And that's going to matter one day. And it does matter, right? Like when, when you're in combat, you don't care who's to the left or right of you about what they look like or what they believe or, or anything like that. You care about can they do the job? Yeah. Can he help me if I need it? And can I help him if he needs it? You really don't care about that stuff. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we should maybe look at this whole thing like that, right? I mean, we talked about Israel not that big of a country, size of New Jersey in terms of, of space of land. I mean, I've been there. There's plenty of places that you could still build and you could still, you know, obviously they have their, their little um, kind of zoning and rules about where, who can build where and when and all this, permits and all this. But there's plenty of land still there. There's enough land for everybody that lives there to live there in peace, in my opinion. You know, and, and so why, why can't that happen? And there's been bad players on both sides of the conflict throughout the conflict's history, I'd say. I mean, there has yeah. to be, right? Yes. It's been going Absolutely. on long enough. There's been bad players on both sides. There's been bad things that's happened on both sides. But at some point, you know, you're kind of looking at it now. The scale's tipped a little bit where one side is probably, you, you, you know, it's hard to argue against, one side probably would lean to peace a lot more than the other side. What do you say to some of the people, and I'm not advocating the stance, I'm just saying this, this is out there. What do you say as, as someone who's been on the ground there and sees what it looks like to some of the people we hear refer to Israel as an apartheid state? <laughs> If it, again, we'll go, we've already said this. I've already kind of said this without mentioning the, the A word. Um, <laughs> how can it be an apartheid state when the oppressed people can join the military, right. own a business, be in the government, right? Have government offices, um, you know, can, can go to school, you know, look at Afghanistan, Right. People couldn't, women couldn't go to school, right? I mean, you name it. If you're an Arab in Israel, if you're a Palestinian person in Israel, you can do anything an Israeli can do. So even with some of the things we already talked about, I, I think, just looking at it from the outside, I think that when people throw around 
you know, that claim or whatever. They're cherry picking a couple of the situations. They're right. cherry picking maybe a, maybe a couple issues that happen in a specific place like Jerusalem. They're cherry picking things that happen with the settlements in the West Bank. I don't personally, you know, if you've studied the apartheid history in South Africa, that's well, apartheid. Yes. You know, I don't see... I've looked at this a bunch. Doesn't mean I'm right, but like I don't see the evidence for anything even near an apartheid no, in Israel that, no. that's 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 happening. I think that's kind of crazy. And I mean, the other thing is they say, well, Gaza's a, a blockade, right? And you go, well, okay. You, you again, it's one of those fancy or, or, or kind of light bulb words that people like to throw out there, like apartheid. And you go, well, a blockade. First of all, they wanted everybody out of there. Mm. They don't want anybody else coming in there. So you're blockading yourself in. And then second of all, Gaza, the Gaza Strip's major export is terrorism. It's 5,000 rockets in 10 hours. It's, right. you know what I mean? I mean, it's incursions with terror tunnels and, and all this kind of stuff. And so you go, I kind of see why you might want to make it difficult for just anybody to come out of that border. For you know, oh sure, reason. yeah, yeah, you, you, you no know argument what I mean? there. And so, if so, you can't use the word blockade, right? You can't use the word blockade. And furthermore, if it's a blockade, Israel sends again tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in food and infrastructure type stuff into Gaza. So where's the blockade? The blockade would be if someone else was trying to get stuff into Gaza. And Israel was stopping it. Fair. To me, yeah. to me, that's more of the definition of a blockade than having a border. A border is not a blockade, and it's a self-imposed border. Right, right. It's it's a little unique. I, I also think it doesn't do any favors to the situation. Just like the way the geography is. If we can put that map in the corner of the screen one more time, just of like Israel, they're like separate. You know what I mean? So you have Israel, like kind of all over the map down the middle and then you have the Gaza strips over here the west banks over there so it's of course it's going to be and it's on as you said earlier as well like it's on Gaza's is bordering Egypt as well so it's on an international border it's yeah but but the other thing there so like throughout history you see where Ashkelon is there right Ashkelon's a beautiful city if you ever go to Israel that's a really cool place to go there a little bit inland uh, no, no, it's right on the it's right on the beach, and the beaches there are beautiful. I can show you some videos. Oh, so it's just and it and it, it has a very uh, important history uh, in the Mediterranean as well, right? Ashkelon does. Um, but look at Gaza. Gaza's yep. entire western border is on the Mediterranean Sea. Right. Why don't right. they use that? Amazing port. <laughs> now, you know. I'm a few credits shy of being any kind of government planning guru, infrastructure, this, international trade, that. But I kind of think if my entire Western border is on the Mediterranean Sea, I'd be trying to offer somebody something to use me as a port. Iran even tries to do that over where they are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I get it. You could say you might have a tough sell because... You know, if I'm bringing stuff into Gaza, how can I get it out of Gaza into Israel? Well, maybe that's when you sit down at the table and you try and figure something mm. out, right? Because mm. what would that do? It would help your people. Yeah. But you don't do that, right? And so so it's like- Again, they're, but they're under that thumb of Hamas. It's going to be a non-starter. But the, uh, Exactly. And so that that's the whole problem. Everything, every, we could sit here and come up with a bunch of really probably- no offense to you, but really stupid ideas on how to fix this thing. Cause that's no not, offense taken, man. Yeah. Cause yeah. that's not what we do, right? Like <laughs> no. it, our job is not to sit down and do international diplomacy between no. two separate countries or whatever. But like, even if we come up with a half decent idea, like something like that, it stops before it even gets started. Yeah. And you know, it's Israel could even broker that in like, Hey, we can do this with them. Maybe we can stop some of the other stuff we have to do that's imposed on us by the international community because we're working and we're doing. So it's like there, there's there's a bunch of things I think that can be done, but again, it stops with that charter, right? The charter says you can't exist and you can't even you, like your country can't exist and you as an individual and as a group can't exist. So how can we even get anywhere? It's it's just nuts. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a rough one. The you had said this way earlier in the podcast. I just didn't want to bury it and and not come back to it. I was just reminded looking at the map. Uh-huh. The border that they share with Egypt. Yes. It's on the Sinai Peninsula right there. Yep. The Sinai is obviously a very historical part of land, but also in the modern warfare arena of mm-hmm. since Israel's formation has been very historical between the Six Day War, yes. the Yom Kippur War, yep. and then you know, like even I think after Yom Kippur, Israel like took a lot of it, but then gave it back afterwards yeah. as like a peace agreement or something. Yep. So it's a desert, mountainous region. Egypt and Israel made a peace officially in 1979. Even after the Arab Spring in 2011, that still remains intact and everything. Mm-hmm. How the hell is ISIS controlling that area? Yeah, so they're they're controlling that area. Um, I don't know how they actually started the control there, but they're running like major. Um, smuggling operations because what happened again remember earlier i said there were two border crossings um into gaza one was was down south near you know the egypt border and the other one was on on the the north side of gaza now the one on the south has been closed obviously because isis is there Mm. so they've turned that into like total black market right they're they're running all kinds of drugs in there they're running all kinds of Weapons, money, all that kind of stuff um, through, they've built tunnels. Um, and I think actually, I think maybe Vice has done a profile on that, mm. on the Egypt um, border. They've done a couple of different stuff on Gaza, I think. But How many original people like were living there though? Because this is, again, this is a very desert mountainous region. Like, in, on the Egypt side? Yeah. I don't know exactly. But it's not like densely populated there, no? Or yeah, am I fucked up on that? I, I don't I don't know. So listen, we were supposed to go um again last week to Israel and, and that trip kinda got bumped out. It was supposed to be November and where we were going was that where we we're supposed mm. to go is the Egypt border. So I'll get down there, I'll kinda get that all reconned up and, and get um a good look and see what's actually going on there. I do know I've seen tons of videos from our guys, um and and pictures obviously, but tons of videos and surveillance videos and everything of some of the border incursions into Israel from Egypt. Mm. Um, and they use a lot of actual kind of the the same kind of um, tactical kind of vehicles. They use a lot of those side by sides and different Polaris type stuff to get through some of that. Uh, the, on the 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 terrorist side, they're using a lot of those high speed vehicles just because the land is so rugged and all that, and they need to be quick to get stuff done. But they're throwing stuff over the fence, they're cutting the fence, they're coming through, um, and then you can see if you pull the map up again, it's easy. It's hard to get people into Gaza. It's much easier to get people into the West Bank, and so um, get wait, them, get them into the West Bank from the east. Uh, from they'll get them into the West Bank from down south in Egypt. They'll go up kind of around. There's a ton of Israeli land between there. Yeah, but there's a lot of um, a lot of open space, and there there is some like Palestinian um, kind of uh, areas there, like towns and stuff like that. So it's and like so an they, underground they railroad. They kind of piggyback it all yeah. the way in uh, through Beersheba and then up into the, into the West Bank. So there's an ISIS presence in the West Bank right now. I don't know. Um, I don't know about ISIS. I don't think so. I think, I think the Palestinian Authority and Islamic Jihad. Don't quote me on Islamic Jihad, but I think the Palestinian Authority and ISIS don't get along, like on any level. You don't say. I I, I think ISIS is pretty like <laughs> people don't like them, and I don't think they like anybody either. No. Right. So, so there's that kind of problem. But again, you said it earlier. Money talks. So if these groups in the West Bank can use groups in the South coming through Egypt to get stuff in. That's what they do. It's the same in Jordan. Our guys, I've never been to the the Jordan border with our guys yet. That's another place we're going to... Jordan's a friend, though. Yeah, there's a lot of terrorism in Jordan, though. Right, 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 right. right. Obviously. Um, but that border is another problematic area for Israel. Because they get stuff from Jordan right into the West Bank. You can see Jordan borders the, the West Bank there. 
I'm almost I'm a little surprised at that though because I'm gonna fuck up the name of this, but the Mukabara I want to say yeah. The, I got that right? Mm, kind of. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I know the guy you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> the Jordanian intelligence, like, you know, the, the king over there is, yeah, is but, boys with America and Israel, and the Jordanian intelligence is pretty damn good. But I think, I think you know, the Jordanians have always kind of been very good at playing both sides, right? And then what they do is... Even today? I think so. Hmm. I mean, look, it wasn't that long ago with the whole Zarqawi stuff and all of that as well, right? Like, obviously. Well, they they were the ones trying to tell people, whoops, like, we need to fix that. Yeah, but the, I think what they do is they like the whole plausible deniability thing, right? I think, I think there's – and look, if you're those kind of groups and you can – get yourself connected in Jordan so you can do things like in Israel or you can, you know, spread your terror networks through Jordan and you can do it under the guise of Jordan's everybody's ally. That's pretty good. Now, I'm not saying that the Jordanian, the Jordanians proper are helping these organizations. Right. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that because of that, kind of structure, I think that these organizations can sneak under the radar. I, I mentioned Joby Warwick earlier in respect to his latest book on Syria with the whole red line. His right. book before that won the Pulitzer, and it's what we did episode 134 on. It was called Black Flags, The Rise okay. of ISIS, yeah. which speaking with a guy I know who's let's say, stationed in the Middle East over there on the intelligence side of things in our military, he said that it's not a requirement, but like every time new guys go out there, read they like yeah. read that book. Like yeah. it's that good. Huh. And Joby, I would push back on some of that Jordan point because one of his major sources in the book and a guy who actually has become on friendly terms with him is the King of Jordan. And to his credit, you know, he he takes blame for the fact that when he rose to power, which he never expected to be in power right. when his father died, he yeah. thought it was going to be the other son. His whole life he had kind of like planned on being something else. He made some sort of like agreement for like a political reset to free a long list of political quote unquote prisoners and – accidentally on that list, they, they didn't check it well enough, according to him, and on that list was Al Zakawi, yeah. who ended up forming what would become ISIS. Right. So there are fuck-ups, like, let's let's be clear. Yeah, but and, and look, uh, you have to kind of look, uh, I, again, I'm not, I, I, I'm not an expert on, you know, the Jordanians and all that kind of stuff, but there is a lot of issues with that border. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying that they're involved, I'm not saying they're being negligent, I'm not saying they're not paying attention, I'm just saying there's problems on that border. So I'm sure they're, you know, I'm sure if they're being a good ally, they are trying to, um, they are trying to fix it, right? Um, right. And, and they are the major kind of peacemaker in the Middle East. They have been yeah. for, for a long time. And that's, that's great. That's excellent. But there's still problems on that border. So for whatever reasons, I, you know, I'm not claiming I know all the reasons. I just know that our guys have a heavy presence on that border. And, Fair enough. and a lot of it's weapons on the Jordanian side. It's weapons. I've what do you mean? Smuggling of weapons in, it, into the West it. Bank. Um, a lot of it comes through Jordan. Okay. Well, the country that doesn't share a border here, but that we've been talking about the whole time is Iran. Yeah. Like we've been talking about potential solutions and, or lack thereof with the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But is there a solution with Iran besides complete and total regime change? I mean, again, I'm a few credits short of being able to come up with something concrete, but it doesn't look like it, right? Short answer, it doesn't look like it because there's just such a, there's just such a fundamental, it's kind of like the Hamas thing, right? They're kind of like, it's not like they're junior Hamas. It's like they're senior Hamas right. in this whole thing. So, um, and and their charter kind of says the same thing, right? Or their constitution actually says the same thing. It says the same thing about us actually too. Yeah, and Israel and America. And yeah, we, and we seem to just not read that. I guess maybe we're maybe our Persian isn't as good <laughs> as it should be when, when you're reading that, right? But yeah, again. This is, and then that, that goes back to that Obama days with the pallets of cash and all this in the middle of the night. And, and even more recently, the $6 billion. Pallets so, of cash in the middle of the night. 
Yeah, when he sent the money over on the C-130 and it was just pallets of cash for the Iranian deal. If I'm familiar with that, I'm forgetting it. But that was a I'm part sure of that deal. Yes, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Ah, that was a fucked up deal. Yeah, but anyway, um, you know, you can't really miss that if, you, or if you're doing anything about Iran and you're scratching around and you know nothing. Someone lands here from Mars and, and, and you know, is asking about Iran and you throw them to Wikipedia or you read their constitution... And it says what it says in there about Israel and the United States. From our perspective, why are we giving them anything? Right. Right? And I get that if that's your enemy, you're trying to smooth stuff over, you're trying to whatever. But they don't want that. Money's not going to appease them. You know, that you're telling me that money doesn't go to Hezbollah, that money doesn't go to does. this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, they're, uh, they're the major state sponsor of terror, I'd say, in the world, Iran. And now we got the issue with, you know, them finding potential as they continue working on some of these things actively and, and down the line, you know, sources of money vis-a-vis -vis trade partnerships with the East, Russia, right. China, you know, and they got money over in those places. Yes. So then it flows in and it's another thing that funds all this stuff. But I mean, and that's one thing I, look, I'm not a warmonger. At all. I don't think we should go to war with every enemy that we perceive that we have. But I also don't want to be jumping in bed with a cobra either, kind of thing, right? And and so you get to the point... What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, if you, how many nights can you sleep in a bed with a cobra before it bites you and kills you, kind of thing, right? Yeah, it's, but isn't that... But if it's Iran and we're constantly like, well, if we, if we do this, they'll be, you know, everything will calm down. Or if we give them that, or if we try and do this, or if we talk about this, I think the other party has to want to be involved. Like, we, we have to sit and say, like, look, do you want, like, Julian, you want to be my friend? I mean, I think I'd like to, but it seems very difficult based on our whole history and all this. Yeah, but if you'd like to, that's a start. So let's work off of that, mm -hmm. right? I don't think you have that conversation with Iran. So, so why, so where are you bringing in this and where are you bringing in 6 billion and where are you bringing in, you know, deals with this? How are you making a deal with somebody who fundamentally says they want to destroy you? I think you at least need to get to the point where you go, I'd like to be a friend. I just don't ever see it happening. It's like, yeah. okay, I, I, I can respect that. But the fact that you want it means we can start there and see where we can get. And maybe we still won't ever be friends, but at least we can try. If I say, do you want to be my friend? You say, no, I want you dead, like yesterday. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, you, this is it's another non-starter. Yeah. And, and I think that's where we're at. And and I get it if, if you know, there's that. And this happened with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for years as well. All these Western leaders, particularly American leaders, wanted to be the one they got the photo up with the handshake. Right. Right? And yeah. and they think they can solve the problem and they and that's great. We're gonna make a great deal. Yeah. I mean a deal of the century. Ambition is great, especially on peace, right? Um, and I'm sure that Peace Prize looks fantastic on your mantelpiece after a career <laughs> in politics and, and everything else. But at some point though, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a, it's at, at some point it's just a duck. Yeah. You know, and you can't turn it into a pigeon, right? It just is what it is. And you just, I don't see why, I'm not saying don't try. I'm just saying the try should be, hey, have you guys come around yet to even having a discussion? Nope. Okay. I'll come back next year, I guess, and knock on your window mm -hmm. and see where you're at. It's just, it's hard to come out with that. And, and what do you, what do they do? Do they sit around in a room and do they say, well, maybe if we give them this. Right. <laughs> Good luck. It just doesn't yeah. seem to work, right? Well, you, you had said that you don't, you, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but you don't care as much about like internal Israeli politics and everything. Right. It does still affect their stances on, you know, the survival of Israel or how that's accomplished, I should say. They all want the survival of Israel. Right. But like with a guy like Netanyahu, who over the past year or so, I, I remember after I had Joby in here, actually, I really started to look closely at him because... I'd had some opinions, and then I was like, can I really, should I really be saying that, though? Like, do I have enough evidence to say that without going into it? But, you know, he has been in power for a long time, and he's very, he seems to be within the country 
very controversial. And yet when I look at not talking about his Israeli-Palestine stances, I'm just talking about like how he how he views Israel and the future of Israel. It seems like his foreign policy is, from the outsider's perspective, more in line with having a strong Israel. So why is he so disliked by so many people there? Not to say he's not liked by a lot of people too, but there are people who obviously hate him over there. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I think a lot of it has to do with some of that corruption stuff or the perceived corruption that was going on, I think, with him and some of his government, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, I would say the the way I tend to try and view a, a, a foreign leader is in their relationship with us, hmm. right? I mean, that's kind of the only thing that would affect me as an American, right? Is not that it even would affect me on a day-to-day or anything, but like if, if you want to even talk about um, Netanyahu's, the big topic of the day, the judicial reform, right? Right. That's never going to affect me. It just isn't. And I shouldn't have a say on that. And neither should you. And it's never going to affect you. But some of that international um, stuff and, and his policy there and his views there and his relationship to us through that, I mean, I think that affects our country, which in turn technically affects us as Americans. Yes. So that's kind of how I tend to evaluate any foreign leader. And I, I mean, look, it's not the best way to do it because in that, the guy could be a scumbag. The guy could be terrible to his own people. The guy could be great to his own people and terrible in foreign policy. You know, it kind of, it could, it could go either way. But I don't think I have a stance to stand up and, and say anything about their domestic politics or um, the opposition right now in Israel or Netanyahu and his his party or his coalition government, you know, it, sure, I can have an opinion on it. I kind of don't want to <laughs> anyway, because it just doesn't matter. I'd yeah. rather put my attention and my, my efforts into other things and, and just kind of keep it at, well, how is this looking in relation to America? And I think the guy... You know, I think he's a tough guy, number one. Like, he's very, very strong. He is. He, love, he, he loves his country. He loves his people. He, I, I think he genuinely wants peace. But he's a, if you step on me, I'll stomp on you kind of guy. And he's and he's proven that. And that does ruffle the international community's feathers. Yeah. I can't say I don't, I, I can't say I don't blame him for having that stance. I think maybe every Israel leader of Israel from any party, regardless of their politics, should maybe have that kind of stance um, just based on their situation, which we've been talking about. Um, but as an ally to the United States, I think he's I think he's above average. I mean, you can't really argue that he hasn't been. I don't know. disagree with that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's look, people are going to cut everything they they want to politically it's it's what it is he's a complex guy yeah there's a lot there's a lot there there's some stuff i was definitely wrong in my interpretations of him and then there's some other stuff i was probably right about but you know i i don't think i don't think one man also has the power to determine it, with, with a with a country with that kind of history you know what i mean and you mentioned earlier the way the government's set up he has to keep on reforming the government right. because all the parties like I think some of that could be a little overblown, but I understand when people are like, oh, "All right, let's get some new blood in there." You, you've but been the, around a but while. the argument is he's been able to do it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which yeah, he's been able to win elections. Which sounds kind of and, and not just win elections. Winning the elections only half the battle there, right? You still then, the government. Then you yeah. still have to put that government together, and you know I don't know kind of what deals. I mean, I know how our government tends to work is you're making deals and you're giving here and taking there and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure they're doing the same kind of thing to, to get that government formed, but he's been able to do it. Yeah. And so that says something. Absolutely. Um, And like you said, I mean, he is a, his terminology for it is he is a peace through power guy rather than power through peace. I mean, I'll tell you this, he's, he's led some very, and, and and I won't say the word in the beginning for, sake of you know giving away my point in the beginning he's led some very strong military actions for his country during his time in power but you can't point to one and said he did it without any provocation 
it's always because of a certain event or mm. a certain, you know, course of events that has happened. Like, I, and not just talk, not just some kind of whatever, but actual military action against his country that he's turned around and again, you step on me, I'll stomp on you. Um, and so you can't really say he's an instigator. Yeah, I'd have to look at all at, at all the things in the full history, not knowing it off the top of my head. But I mean, some of the things that are popping in my mind, you're right. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, look, there, there's that old saying as well, where like you, you, they say, "Oh, the Palestinian people will throw rocks," and then uh, the Israelis come with a tank. And it's like, okay, well, if you don't want me to come with a tank, don't throw a rock. Don't throw a rock. Yeah. If you threw a rock, would the tank be there? The answer is no, because it right. wasn't there yesterday when you weren't throwing rocks becomes the never ending, you know, <laughs> circle of life there. You know, I mean, time. what do you yeah. want them to do? Get rid of the tank and bring a spear? Right. And then when you kill them, <laughs> they can complain, right? I mean, right. it's it just turns into, why don't you just stop throwing the rock or, or whatever the case yeah. is, right? Um, you know, it's just that those kind of arguments, again, I tend to try and stay away from those because those should be very obvious and, and they're very silly, right? Yeah, it just comes down to people's, skin in the game on it right. with, with what they're going to argue. We, one other thing I forgot about your, some of the work you've been doing over there. And, and like you said, there's stuff you can't talk about too. So stop me if, if this is there, but outside the military, have you had any contact with any of the three intelligence arms, be it Amon, which is military intelligence, Shimbet, which is kind of like their FBI or Mossad? I am not going to say. Okay. About the that side of anything um okay. yeah i mean it's uh israel's a very interesting place and they're very good at what they do and you know yeah it's it's one of those things where you know we're we're actually lucky to be there and to do what we do there and i don't want to mess any any of that up um you know Obviously, still, we're looking to do more there. God willing, this thing ends by the time we're done with this podcast and we're not going to go there this week and we can wait and, and have a much better visit in November as planned. Um, but we're going to keep going back there. We're going to keep building things out and we're going to um, we're gonna just continue to help people there. I'll say, in just because I know you're asking and I know you like this kind of stuff, in in Ukraine, yes, we've had contact with intelligence agencies. Coming up very soon. There. We'll yeah, talk about that. So, um, but yeah, in Israel, I just there's a lot of stuff we can't talk about just because of number one them and and we're just very privileged to be there and to be a part of that and to to be allowed to have these missions there that we're trying to do for regardless we can say it's for their people or we can say it's 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 to help the better good of that country but they don't have to let us go there they don't let, have to give us access to what they have and i mean to be honest i'm still blown away that we are there and doing what we're doing there it's you know it's working and it's going well and they're great they they really are great and and um, you know, I'm I'm proud of those guys. It's I mean, I've been on the phone. You've seen me all day getting yeah. messages. I mean, it's mm -hmm. I still have a guy I can't get a hold of, and my messages aren't even getting through to him. And and he's a guy that you know he's he's an incredible war fighter with an incredible history. He's so I'll, I'll explain this guy without saying his name or without saying where he lives or anything like that. Um, just because I want to get this story out there is. Um, He's younger than me. I'm 41 years old. I think he's 38, 37. Been in the military all of his adult life. And for many Israelis, where they live and where they serve are two different places, right? Like if you live in Tel Aviv and you where you serve is somewhere in the West Bank, okay, but when you're done, you can go home. Like you can go home at night sometimes, right? Depending on what your job is, depending on what you're doing, you can go home at night. Where this guy lives is one of the hardest hit places by rockets from Gaza. So when he goes mm -hmm. and serves, he's in a shitty place because he's a he's an actual war fighter. He's, he's a savage guy. He's seen a lot of combat. He's seen a lot of, you know, horrible stuff to kids and women and, and all kinds of stuff. But when he goes home, he's still in the thick of it. And I can't relate to that, right? Every place that we've been, 
as as Americans, whether it's any of my my friends that I served with or guys now that I know in other branches and all this kind of stuff in different units, whenever we went and did anything, we went away from America to do it. You, you don't come home and you're still in it. And this, this guy, goes back to that, yeah. And he's had this for his entire life and he's the most gentle, down to earth, happy guy, um, you know, but you can tell when you hear his story and you hear him, you can tell there's there's heavy, heavy heaviness there. You know, um, I mean, he has he has to live in a place where every building has a bomb shelter. Yeah. In it. Every structure has a bomb shelter, including the kids' soccer field has bomb shelters. Every house has a bomb shelter, and um, you know, again, we don't have to live with that. I've said this quote many times on the podcast, and I'm sure I'll say it many times moving forward. Sometimes in America, I look around at the things we make problems out of, and I oh. say, we have not been invaded, and it really fucking shows. <laughs> yeah. I it mean, really does. But I mean, I, I've thought about that since meeting him and since, you know, um, being in contact with him and actually, you know, going on patrol with the guy and stuff. And I just, for someone, say, with my background, I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine going and doing an operation and then going home and being in a place that is that heavy with stuff happening. There's no break, right? I mean, the break is when they're not firing rockets at you, I suppose. But that could happen at any time. And it and it, and it has happened at just random times as well. Like this random time, obviously. Yeah. Um, but to constantly have that is weighing over your head. And, and I know what that's like. I know what it's like to go and do an operation or to be in combat and, and whatever. To go home and have that and never get out of that mentality has to be difficult. And he's had that his entire, you know, he's had that his entire adult life. It's crazy. It's wild, man. Can't, can't comprehend it. Yeah. Over here. Last question on, on this issue, and then we'll get to Ukraine with okay. a new podcast. How do you, you know, we, we've seen situations where in recent history, because it always happens, where this tension flares up. We saw a big situation in, I want to say, like June 2021, where right. there were all the rockets coming in. And now we've been looking at the videos all day with this. It's fresh. Six months from now, what what do you think this looks like? Do things change? Is, there, is the Gaza Strip situation different? What do you think? No, I think what will happen is um, kind of what happened in um, March, which actually got us into Ukraine into Israel and 2021 and all that stuff too. Israel is going to fight back as they're doing. Thank God. And it's going to go until the armament on the, we'll say Palestinian side for lack of a, well, we'll say the Hamas and friends side, right? Cause I don't want to just say Palestinians. Um, we'll say on the terrorism side, um, it'll go until their armaments deplete to where they can't sustain it anymore. And then you'll see someone like Jordan or Egypt step in, help broker some kind of peace uh, for this conflict. Yeah, right. All, the, all their kind of peace deals now are very isolated to that incident kind of peace. So we'll see that. And then it'll just be tick along until they can reload and revamp and do it all over again. And the merry ground goes round. And, and I, I mean, I really, we can come back and we can watch this, but that's what happened in March. And, you know, it's all summer being there and being connected to some of our non-Israeli people there um, that are there in various capacities um, have said something really big has been brewing. And I think the one in March lasted, what was it, five days, six days? Sounds right. I to the, remember for yeah, sure. It was five or six days, something like that. And it was very isolated to rockets from Gaza into southern yeah. Israel. It this was, seems like a lot more. Yeah, it was to Stero, it was to Ashkelon, it was it was those kind of uh areas. Um and whatever. It was it was terrible. It was it was terrible. There wasn't a ton of incursions like but but this is yeah, this is like a fully you know, this is this is a big thing. This is actual I mean, that's war too, but this is actual, this could turn into something yeah. a little more prolonged. Yeah. Um, I think 2021, how long did that go on for with the tunnels? That was, that was a couple of months, was it? Three, four months? I can't remember exactly. 
I don't want to say. Or am I thinking? Or am I thinking? Twenty seventeen was that other big one that lasted a the while. The one that I'm thinking of in twenty twenty one, if I'm correct here, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, was when this was when the Iron Dome became like a big, like the world knew about it because Hamas was sending all kinds of rockets from Gaza, and then Israel sent back and. I guess Naftali Bennett at this point was the PM, so Biden was coming in saying they had a right to defend themselves. You, you know what's funny? What's funny about all this is, so the one I'm thinking is the one previous, but it's funny that there's so many of them that we confuse them. I know. It's crazy, <laughs> man. It's fucking crazy. I mean, the fact that we, you know, we're going to end the, this Israel portion on that <laughs> just just takes care of everything that we've talked about, right? So, But I think it will be the same. I think it will just be, you know, they, they, they wait until they're depleted. They time it right. They get, you know, the the West gets the, those Middle Eastern power players, Egypt, Jordan, to, to help broker something. And it just goes to, you know, you'll probably see an uptake in some stuff going on in the West Bank. Um, they're talking about an incursion, an Israeli incursion into Gaza, which yeah, I was saying that's, that. that's massive. That's that a whole, that's a whole, a whole other world. level because I, I can't remember, but, but it's been years since they did that into Gaza. That's a whole other thing, right? Because then you start getting other Middle Eastern players. Do they take possession of it now? Like it gets weird. They, they, it starts to get weird. Yeah. And, and they, when they did it before, they said, no, no, this is just the end. Kick the doors in, do what we have to Leave. do and get out. And they did it, right? And and they they held to that. But it still gets a bit squirrely when you're doing stuff like that. But once the piece is brokered, you know, there'll be some stuff in there where it's like, well, you have to give us some lower level commanders and they'll they'll kind of like give them the 10 digit grids for where those dudes are. And and then they'll be Israel will be able to say we went and got these guys after the fact, after the peace, and there'll there'll be some of that. And then it'll just be, we'll wait until we give maybe Iran another six billion and they can, you know, get they pay for all the weapons and do all that kind of stuff. So crazy shit, man. Well, this has been great talking about Israel. And obviously we hope to see some sort of peaceful solution here if that's even possible. Yeah, it's, but, it's, it's been crazy. Obviously we were not coming here to kind of talk no. about this this way. And it just, I've never done a podcast like this. It's you know, Fresh. I, I hope everybody likes it. It's kind of all over the place and, and definitely different, but we're trying to keep up with stuff that's yeah, it's, it's live kicking news, off in man. real real time. Yeah, you, you did great. Let's let's go get some get some food and then we'll come back and we'll do another podcast on Ukraine. Perfect. All right. All right, guys, that's the end of episode one of our two episodes with Mark. That's right. We have another one coming next week. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, smash that like button, and let me know what you thought about this episode down in the comment section below. Mark and I will return on the next JDP episode where we'll be discussing all the defense work he's been doing around the world. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. You're not going to want to miss it. That said, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.